Testing, oh yeah, that's working well. We'll just uh, wait another minute or two. There are people still trickling in and uh, we'll get started shortly. So we've got quite a eclectic uh, group of speakers today. Um, we're going to cover everything uh, to do with plants and consciousness, including uh, making plants unconscious, and then how plants can alter our consciousness. So it's uh, hopefully it'll be a full circle uh, type of gathering here, and uh, answer all your burning questions about uh, plants and consciousness. So, uh, are you ready, Deepak? Yes. Okay. So, our first speaker is uh, world renowned. I'm sure all of you know his uh, writings and his works. Um, he's the ideal uh, person to uh, begin a panel, a workshop on consciousness, because uh, he uh, believes in a universal consciousness that includes plants and animals and us and, uh, and the universe in general. And uh, with no further ado, I'll hand the, the uh, mic over to Deepak. Just turning off the phone. <clears throat> so I'm very happy to start this uh, panel on consciousness. And of course, there's a discussion on plants and plant consciousness. Uh, I don't know what I can contribute to that, but I'll be here for that and um, see where we're going. Rajneesh and I have had many conversations about the microbiome and also about the planetary microbiome, which might be the key actually to reversal of climate change. So I would look forward to that conversation as well. But as you know, we come to these conferences to learn from each other and also share our own points of view. And uh, uh, very honestly, I've struggled with my point of view <clears throat> over a lifetime. So um, can we have that timer going so I know how much time I have? You have the timer going. So um, just a little background. Uh, I'm a physician by training. And um, I trained in Boston at uh, Harvard, Tufts, BU. And then um, after internal medicine, I uh, studied endocrinology. And then after that, neuroendocrinology. And um, my... Uh, my uh, my boss was Seymour Reichlin, who's now 97. And uh, he was then in the 70s, he was, uh, he was um, the president of the American Endocrine Society. And um, uh, he was one of my favorite professors. At 97 today, he lives somewhere nearby in Arizona. Uh, but he still comes to NYU once a year. If he catches a snake in his garden, he's still looking for neuropeptides. And uh, uh, he still argues with me about the hard problem of consciousness. And uh, uh, he's just an amazing person. And he, at 97, he's one of the sharpest intellects I've known. So I'm very grateful for that training because it led me into this whole area, uh, which is uh, initially called, was we were calling mind-body, uh, the mind-body connection. So when I was training, 
<clears throat> there was a Nobel Prize awarded to a woman called uh, Rosalind Yallo for discovering uh, the methodology that we now know as radio immunoassay. And so we were looking at all these molecules that uh, everyone's familiar with. Serotonin, dopamine, oxytocin, uh, opiates, many others. And one day, one of my colleagues, Candice Pert, who later became the chief of uh, brain chemistry at the NIH, she used the word, these are molecules of emotion. I said, why don't you write a book about this? And she said, I will really write the foreword. And so I did, and that was my first interest in how consciousness uh, influences biology. And we know that, know that emotions have biological consequences. Anger, frustration, resentment, hostility, guilt, shame, uh, all these uh, dysfunctions, you might say, in self-regulation of emotions does result in biological distress. And uh, if you have, on the other hand, emotions like joy and compassion and empathy and equanimity, uh, if your mind settles down, biology also settles down. So that was my foray. But then I met uh, my guru from India, and he said, what are you doing? What are you studying? I said, I'm studying the molecules of emotion. And he said, oh, they're not real. And that set me thinking too. Uh, if molecules are not real, then matter is not real. And so it's been a struggle. The hard problem of consciousness is a struggle. If you go now, to Wikipedia or wherever, the number one open question in science is what's the universe made of? The number two open question in science is what's the biological basis of consciousness? So having struggled with that, uh, I realized that the universe is made of nothing and there's no biological basis of consciousness. Biology is an experience in consciousness. So, of course, as we go into these conferences, some of, the, some of the arguments we have, the debates we have, are also about terminology. Because, you know, if you're speaking of two different things, using the same words, there's never going to be agreement. So let me share with you what I think is consciousness, okay? And this comes from non-dual traditions and spiritual traditions. It makes sense to me. Uh, it may or may not make scientific sense to you. So the science is based on subject-object split, which is artificial to begin with. Science is a particular methodology in human consciousness using particular protocols. It reveals as much as it conceals. In fact, it probably uh, conceals much more, the scientific method conceals much more than it reveals. So what is the definition of consciousness from the non-dual traditions of the world, such as, um, such as Vedanta, Kashmir Shaivism, and even aspects of Buddhism? Here it is. Consciousness is the source of all experience. One definition. Second definition, consciousness is that in which all experience occurs. It is also that in which all experience is known. If we, we are having an experience right now. Uh, this is a perceptual experience and a cognitive experience. So, but this is happening in our awareness, this experience. The experience of the mind, the body, the physical world, for lack of a better word, is happening in awareness. If there's a reality outside awareness, it's not known to me. I can only be aware of things that reveal themselves to me, either 
perceptually or cognitively. So consciousness, that in which experience occurs, that in which experience is known, and out of which experience is made. But that last part is kind of interesting. Consciousness is that out of which all experience is made. Consciousness modifies itself into perceptual activity, a species-specific perceptual activity, and a cognitive um, uh, experience as well. And then we have human constructs like mind, body, and the physical world. There's a human construct from so molecules to galaxies. Yeah, human constructs. So, you know, I was attending a conference a while back at MIT. Somebody asked what, the same question, what's the universe made of? And there was a mathematician and uh, in that conference, he says, there's no such thing as a universe. It's a human construct for sensations, images, feelings, thoughts that we interpret as that Milky Way galaxy. But given that, even that, Right now, if you ask cosmologists the nature of the universe, they'll say um, there are two trillion galaxies. I'm not making this up. Look it up. Two trillion galaxies. 700 sextillion stars. I don't even know how to count that. And then uncountable trillions of planets. Possibly 60 billion habitable planets just the Milky Way galaxy, based on the Goldilocks zone, and you know, you're too close to the sun, it's too hot, no life, too far away from the sun, too cold, no life, as we know it. But within this range, um, the Goldilocks zone, there's the possibility of life. And if you talk to string theorists or Caltech physicists, uh, Sean Carroll, they're talking about infinite universes. And all this is based on modeling from quantum mechanics, which is a good mathematical calculation for creating technology. But I don't think it reveals the truth. Uh, it just reveals our human capacity to predict the results of experiments. So of course, this conversation has been going on for a long time. And I took the liberty because I knew Susan was going to be here of looking at some recent cover stories from the New Scientist, which is a British magazine. So what is reality? The more we look at it, the less real it seems. Your thinking body. I was vilified for my book, Quantum Healing, when I suggested that our whole biological organism is a network of energy and information, and that is what the mind is. The mind is a relational and embodied process that regulates the flow of energy and information in uh, an ecosystem of living beings. But now we're getting a little bit even more interesting. How did humans learn to speak? And believe it or not, there's no biological theory of the evolution of language. Language just seems to be the recycling of cultural concepts in consciousness, and then biology follows. Is consciousness fundamental to the cosmos? So we'll be looking at a new, new um, era right now where the zeitgeist is changing to the idea that consciousness is the fundamental ground of all experience and all human constructs. Consciousness conceives, governs, constructs, and becomes the reality that we perceive. But the reality with, that we perceive is not real. Call it what you will, a dreamscape, uh, a simulation, uh, something that we create. You know, it's not entirely a new idea. Wittgenstein, the great... Uh, German philosopher said, our life is a dream. We are asleep, and once in a while, we wake up enough to know that we're dreaming. So, you know, when I, uh, when I read that phrase the first time, I said, what happened to my childhood? It's a dream now. What happened to my teen years? A dream. 
But what happened to yesterday? It's a dream. What happened to this morning? It's not there anymore as a real or so-called real experience. What happened to five minutes ago? What happens to these words by the time you hear them? They don't exist. So this is a lucid dream in a vivid now. And it's very convincing. And the goal of spiritual traditions is to wake up from the dream. So you realize what essential reality is beyond the appearance of sensations, perceptions, images, feelings, and thoughts. You can ignore this, but this is my daily practice now. I spend, you know, I'm in this final stage of my life, 75 plus. I'm biologically still a believer that biological age doesn't have to match chronological age. Um, I'm living that in my life right now. My, uh, my biology is in good shape. I don't have any illnesses. I take care of myself with all these practices. And I just want to mention that I have now delved very deeply into my own personal practice of meditation, uh, the reflective inquiry, uh, vipassana, mindfulness, silence, uh, self-inquiry, uh, looking at perceptions directly, but also vagal stimulation and experiencing samadhi every night, experiencing myself as without a body or without a mind or without a personality or without an ego identity. And that's where some of the conversation is going with VR and augmented reality and psychedelics as well. So next month or this month, I'm actually leading a panel on psychedelics at the World Economic Forum, because along with a psychiatrist, a neuropsychiatrist in New York, we are um, using psychedelics for people going through end stages of life. Terminal um, lucidity happens in certain people where everything becomes clear and reality is revealed to them and it has certain kinds of gamma wave brain frequencies uh, that we've been able to replicate. So I sit with patients through the dying process with a neuropsychiatrist, sometimes taking them through ketamine, which is approved sometimes through magic mushrooms and soon through other substances as well. But here's what we call the direct method of inquiry. When you look at experience directly, a substance called matter is not to be found. Only what can be found is our own experience of sensations. And that by means all sensations, sense perceptions, sound, color, taste, smell, shape, form, um, texture. That's what we experience. We also experience images. We call it imagination. We experience feelings, thoughts. And that's what we experience. We don't experience something called matter. Matter is an experience for this, this, this. Matter is a construct when we give direct experiences meaning or narrative we generate perceptions. And then, of course, the perceptions are direct perceptions of color, shape, and form. Color, shape, and form is the only visual perception. So if I asked you, what is this? You'd probably say, it's a hand. And that's a nice human construct, that it's a hand. But a baby would not know this is a hand. A baby would visually see color, shape, and form. That's it. A baby listening to me would not experience language, noise. But when we give a perceptual experience meaning or narrative, then it creates the perceptual experience of an object out there, even though it's a perceptual experience, a modified activity 
of our own consciousness reified as an object there or as this body. So if you say, I have a body, then please qualify. You started as a fertilized egg, and then you were a zygote, then an embryo, then a baby. Uh, which body are you talking about? We give continuity of, uh, to our body, but actually there's no such thing. It's a construct derived from perceptual and cognitive ability, which is, which is a modification of consciousness, a modality of consciousness. This is a modality of consciousness. So is this, so is this, so is this, so is the brain, so is the Milky Way galaxy and all those two trillion galaxies, two trillion galaxies. If we just looked at that with scale, then planet Earth is not even a speck of dust not even a speck of dust in all the beaches of the world of the world so the other day i went to a beach and i picked up a speck of dust put it in my hand and it flew away it was it was ungraspable and on this little speck of dust in what seems to be a boundless void we have a species called homo sapiens says i'm going to figure it out I mean, either that's a uh, extreme self-assurance and self-confidence, or that's hubris of the ultimate uh, order. How can one species somewhere on a speck of dust in what appears to be a mindless void, figure out the mystery of existence? Okay. You know, at the end, you realize that all experiences like that, direct experience, sound, noise, given meaning, poetry, music, uh, direct experience, tactile, sensation. That's all we experience, taste. Given meaning, it becomes lemonade or kombucha or whatever else you want to call it. So all perception is learned phenomenon. We learn to perceive. As soon as we're given a name and an identity, and then no objects are named for us, which are actually experiences in consciousness. We reify them. And when we give uh, meaning to them, then we generate emotions. If the emotions are happy, we feel pleasurable sensations. If they are unhappy, we feel uh, unpleasurable sensations. And actually, they're the same. Pleasure and pain are the same emotion. You can show that by VR, interpreted differently through learned perception. So in medical school, actually, I was exposed to an experiment, won the Nobel Prize for those scientists. They brought some kittens up in a room that had only horizontal stripes. Other kittens in a room that had vertical stripes. And when these cat kittens grew up to be cats, one group of cats could see only a horizontal world. The other group of cats, only a vertical world because their initial interpretation of their experience determined even the neural networks that reinforced their perceptual experience. So all perception is a magical lie. My perception tells me the earth is flat. Nobody believes that anymore. My perception tells me that this ground I'm standing on is stationary. I know it's spinning at dizzying speeds, it's hurtling through space at thousands of miles an hour. My perception tells me that your body is three dimensional, solid, has location in space time. And we know it's proportionately as void as intergalactic space. So why does it look like this? That's again the heart problem. So the storyline created by emotions and thoughts is the creation of everyday reality that we call mind, body and world. Mind, body, and world are human constructs, they are illusions. And illusions are make it mistaken for reality because we are embedded in them. Even our own body-mind is an illusion. So um, this magical lie in Eastern wisdom traditions is called Maya. Maya is the goddess of illusion who hides the truth. And behind the veil of illusion is truth. And um, 
to what purpose the only answer is probably the joy of creativity the joy of uh, the joy of uh, creating something out of the formless that appears as form so once you understand the trick behind the web of magical lies maya interestingly enough the word sanskrit word maya is related to the word matter matter is illusion maya matter matrix time music measurement are all the finite illusions of the infinite formless and so you know going back to a lot of indian poetry um, and also sufi poetry tagore says in this playhouse of infinite forms i caught sight of the formless and that revealed the truth to me there's a very interesting conversation between einstein and and tagore if you care to read it you can find it on the internet 1930 where einstein who is what we call the scientific realist uh, and uh, uh, tagore we might call him a pl platonist uh, idealist they spoke about reality and einstein said science is my religion because i believe there's an objective world independent of our experience of it and um, of course the answer to that is how do we know we've never experienced a world outside of our own awareness so that philosophy of scientific realism is now called naive realism which means that the picture of the world is exactly the way it looks like to human eyes don't never mind the eyes of an owl or the echo of ultrasound of a bat what is reality no such thing so once we know the trick behind the illusion then these are the so called consequences and this is the religious experience really the religious experience is knowing your existence without form as transcendent the spontaneous emergence of platonic values truth goodness beauty harmony love compassion joy equanimity and finally freedom from the fear of death because death happens to the illusion and not to you and all this is entangled you know we talk about quantum entanglement but as humans we are qualia entangled we are meaning entangled we are the metabolic experience expression of experience happening in consciousness and so right now what you're seeing on the screen is a bunch of colors but if you give meaning to it you could see a woman sitting in front of a mirror or you could see a skull what is it is neither it's a bunch of colors which are modified forms of consciousness there's no color in the physical world just like there's no sound in the physical world there's no such thing as flavor in the physical world these are modified forms of consciousness given meaning here you could choose to see mother in law father in law daughter in law depending on the meaning you give here again the meaning you give to the experience determines whether you're seeing an old man with a beard or a mexican on a horse a butterfly landing on flowers or a face same thing birds returning to their chicks or a woman's face a woman with locks or or mountain sky and backdrop of uh, of the sky same thing here so i like this slide particularly because it comes from a poem of william blake who says we are led to believe a lie when we see with and not through the eye that was born in a night to perish in a night while the soul slept in beams of light so when we see through the eye we see through the conditioned perceptual window the conditioned mind the conditioned human mind but when we see through the eye we experience the formless so here the face that you see or the dragons that you see are not there 
And here too, the face that appears in the picture is not there. And so through practices such as pranayam, breathing techniques, settling the mind, or what I call metacognition, observing ourselves, having a perceptual experience, observing ourselves, interpreting the perceptual experience, and observing ourselves, making a choice, we start to begin to experience the formless. I used this word in a book recently, meta means beyond, and meta human means beyond the human condition mind. But actually I discovered when I was writing the book that the phrase had been used by, um, by uh, uh, the transpersonal psychologist uh, Maslow. Meta means beyond, and in this case, meta human means beyond the conditioned mind. These are some of the practices overriding reactivity, giving attention to uh, compassion and non judgment, introception, tuning into the wisdom of the body. Transcendence, metacognition, being a witness to both inner and outer reality. And the stages that emerge of consciousness as a consequence, the waking state, which is a lucid dream, the dream state, which we experience every day, the deep sleep state, which is non-local awareness. But if you could be present to that, that in our tradition is called soul consciousness. There's an awareness that I'm fast asleep. And then if that awareness that I'm fast asleep lingers in waking, dreaming and sleeping, that's called cosmic consciousness, which means local and non local consciousness. If you experience the same subject of experience in the other, that's called divine consciousness, you realize it's the same consciousness, differentiating into different species of experience. And ultimately, you go beyond that, you realize there's only one consciousness, and everything else was a perceptual trick. So that brings us to what we call awareness as the field of possibilities. Awareness is without cause. Awareness as fundamental and unpredictable, not random, unpredictable. Unpredictable is a better word because it suggests creativity, infinitely creative unfolding through synchronicity and free of its own modifications rooted in the knowing I am. And these are some of the milestones that not only I have looked at, our research has looked at with Jeffrey Martin, how there's a sense of shift of self, a change in emotions to being more connected, a shift in cognition, quieter mind, a shift in perception, a shift in memory, not victimized by memory, more insight, intuition, vision, creativity, and transcendence, loss of personal agency. It seems that that which is making these choices right now doesn't really exist, and ultimately loss of the fear of death. So I'll stop here, um, but before I, I do that, I want to maybe give you an experience. So are you all present here right now? So please be a little more enthusiastic. Are you yes. here? Yes. Okay, that's good. Once more. Are you are you here right now? Yes. Okay. Now I'm going to ask you the same question. Please don't answer it till I lift my hand. Okay. Are you present here? So, are you present here is a thought. The answer is also a thought. And thoughts are entangled with perceptions, images, feelings, constructs, memories. But you're not the thought, you're the presence that modifies itself into all experience. And that presence is in between the thought, but it's also in the thought. It's transcendent and local, immanent and also eternal and timeless. 
awareness has no shape or form. So let me ask you the same question. Don't answer it, just slip into it. Are you present? This is the only thing that's real, this silent presence. Everything else is modified, impermanent, a lucid dream in the vivid now. So I close with the Rumi who said, God's language is silence. Everything else is poor translation. Thank you for listening to the poor translation. Well, thank you, uh, Deepak, for that. Oh, thank you for that uh, thought provoking lecture, uh, which of course none of us heard or uh, will remember ever, but uh, really good. Uh, I'm looking forward to the meditation sessions for that exact purpose. Uh, next uh, speaker up is uh, Patricia Gonzalez, a local um, University of Arizona professor who is very much tuned into the Native American uh, philosophies and traditions around consciousness. And she'll give us a story that I think is very similar to what uh, Deepak has just given us. Uh, so with that, I'll hand it over to her. Tomorrow morning, uh, 8 o'clock, I'll be going through some of the modalities of meditation experience that I practice myself. So if you have the time, desire, ability to come, please do. Greetings, everyone. You can hear me OK? Yeah. Hi. Um, very glad to be here. Um, my name is uh, Patricia Gonzalez. I descend from three generations of traditional healers. My family um, were Kikapu and Comanches who went into old Mexico and married in with the Masewal peoples and the people of the Huasteca or the Mayan people who mig migrated down into what we know today as Northern Mexico. And, the, and also we are from the Chichimeca people or the Chichimeca territory of Mexico. And I'll, I'm also part of the, the tribalized people of Texas and we were there before Texas was created or before Mexico. Um, <clears throat> so I, that's uh, coming from a, a, my great grandpa, my grandma's doctored, um, and we call it doctoring in English. Uh, I've, um, I went on to get a PhD and I teach three courses on traditional medicine at the University of Arizona, both on American Indian medicine and Mesoamerican medicine. And I'm a baby catcher. And I'm also a traditional herbalist. I've worked with people of, in the community um, in a traditional way, which is not charging, being of service like my grandpa and my, my grandmas and my great grandpa, because we believe when you've been touched by creation to heal, um, <clears throat> you give it freely. That doesn't mean people don't compensate you. Um, it just means that we give it freely and then the people determine um, how, how they best can uh, reciprocate. So um, this title uh, is what I'm going to be talking about a little bit about um, <clears throat> how we have to understand uh, plants um, through a specific place and how we evolved as indigenous peoples through the plant people. They are our elders and like grandmother earth, they are our grandparents. 
So I'm recovering from a concussion. So I might have to get back on my cane. I'm gonna sit most of the time and I'm gonna be reading part-time and, and trying to figure out this uh, stick. Okay. So those are just some books that I've written on indigenous medicine. And then I'm gonna read a bit and then I'm gonna to go to slides and then talk about the slides. <clears throat> Uh, to understand plants in consciousness, we must understand the power of place and indigenous philosophies of a living universe that has agency, intelligence, and life potential in all things. Thus, to understand plants in consciousness, we must understand the agreements that we made as we were created as human beings from the plants, from the water, from the fire, and from the earth. We made and went into um, almost like treaties and accords. We made compacts with the non-humans who were also peoples. These uh, are part of intricate relationships of knowledge and it's important to understand them when we start to think about the use of plants outside of their culture and within their culture. And they represent what the great uh, native scholar Vine Deloria called aspects of a living universe that may produce phenomenon of an active living universe. So very much similar, I think, to Dr. Chopra. Uh, we understand the potential field. In fact, multiple fields of potential that are called forth in our ceremonies. And Dr. Gregory Cajete, Santa Clara Pueblo uh, scholar, talks about ceremonies being a way to ask for knowledge. And so these are, these intricate knowledge systems are what so many non-native peoples try to understand as part of uh, something that's often contained is usually uh, and contained within a particular culture and a particular place. I'm going to, these are just some ideas on interrelationship, but these are important when we talk about understanding plants as people and plants as living beings and therefore having consciousness that there was, um, an understanding through what we would call natural law, there, there's mutual recognition, this idea of mutuality as, as we note in this slide. So I wanna just make a caution that there is not one Indian medicine. There are many systems, there are, there are systems of knowledge. There are systems that uh, can include what we would call philosophy and what many scholars now recognize as a form of native science. In this field, to understand the plants, again, we must return to this understanding of a multiple, multiple dimensions of experience that are called forth through ceremony, through protocol, through deep respect, through deep discipline. And so just as I just introduced yourself in my human world, I'd like to introduce you to the plants that are here with us today that I'll talk a little bit about. They are plants that grow here in the desert. There are plants that were, um, that the Spanish tried to eradicate because they were used ceremonially and therefore they were a threat to another knowledge system. And these are plants that um, are recognized as teachers, as governors, as um, leaders, as chiefs, in different names they would translate in this way. And they are here with me today to witness my words and to witness the words we have on the panel. So I'm gonna talk about this image I might have to go down there. I don't think you're going to be able to see it very well, unfortunately. Um, so when we were talking about the panel, I wanted to, I mentioned that there are, um, the plants have to be understood within this larger system. I think if I, if I go up there would, and point that way, will they see it up on the top screen? If I go to one of the screens? Okay, all right. This is a painted book. We had books in Mesoamerica and women painted books and men painted books. And women were doctors and philosophers and scientists and judges and landowners and rulers. 
And this is a codex that comes from taking one of those plants that we might call mind altering today. It came from ceremony. And this plant, this ceremony, this book, which is a thousand years old, survived one of the bonfires that were, they said that when the Spanish came and they burned our books, they, they burned for days. And this one, when you see the facsimile or you see a, a, a copy of it, you see the burn marks, it was retrieved from one of the book burnings. So let's see if I, my pointer will work. Ah, a little bit, okay. This is a depiction of Venus, but these were not just symbols. They were formulas of thought. They were formulas and forms that contained an expression of what was happening in the universe during a particular time period. There was a ceremonial time to honor Venus, but why would we need to know about Venus? Because we wanted to survive because we wanted to honor the plants and the water. We wanted our plants to be able to grow. We wanted the water to come. We wanted to, the plants would have to go very healthy and large. We wanted to feed our people. We wanted to make sure our elders were fed and our children had good water and that the pregnant women would be healthy. So the sacred comes from our ability to live in a natural world during very difficult times in which we didn't have um, the kinds of uh, the necessities that we have now to access water. Although, you know, here in Tucson, we know we're coming to a time where we may not have the water. And so this actually, here are two spiders that are ceremonial forms indicating movement because the spiders are weavers. And so within some of the traditions of how we come to understand reality, is to understand what presides and helps activate reality and change. And so among the Mesoamerican people, there was a spider woman who was a weaver and she presided over time, she wove time. She uh, was the presider over the trade and merchants who came all the way into what we call North America today, carrying their sacred books. She presided over birth, over our sweat lodges, over night medicine, she was uh, erected sometimes at the entrances of cities and she ruled time. She was um, a ruler, not a rule like we might think today. She, her influence, her presence was to influence our experience of time and to measure time. So another way to think of creator and creation was to think of the measurement of time. And so this is a moment of time. And here we have, uh, they're descending as a being right here. And this is again, a depiction of, of uh, goes over several pages of, of Venus uh, manifesting in a particular time. And here we see a little midwife and you might see her little hands there. It's pretty far from you all from over there, but there's little hands and, and those are like little crocodile hands. So this is a primordial being coming out of the waters of a midwife, midwifing time. And so, um, in other native traditions, we have a thought woman. And so among the Pueblo, there's thought woman, and she's also sometimes referred to as spider woman among the Hopi. Uh, there's also spider woman of the Cherokee, there's spider woman of the Navajo. So these, uh, in one, one Leslie Mormon Silco writes a wonderful book about thought woman as the, one, the ones that thought things into being. And among the Mayan, among the life, Formers, another word for what people might call deities. We didn't have gods because when we use that word, then we go to that perception that Dr. Chopra was talking about and we project onto the idea of gods when in fact what we had were forces and powers and energies and inspirited beings of life that help to affect change. And so these are just some examples. So the life makers and the life form, formers among the Mayan, there's a creation story that says they created the humans so that they would have someone to talk to. So it's within those kinds of constructs that we have to understand the idea of plants and consciousness. And also within this image, I just wanna mention there's cotton. Let's see if I can find it cotton in stars, um, woven into the stars. And this band here, which is considered a band of stars, 
in the universe is um, depicted with the sign of Malinali. And Malinali means twisted herb. And twisted herb then um, is, a, a, you might say, a star-studded twisted herb. And so the twisted herb represented movement and duality. And so all of these then were formulas to understand the process of life. And, the, and that the above world, the star world, and its impact on the earth world and the human world, and the human world's impact upon the star world and the above world and the dimensions. <clears throat> so in understanding that, as I just put this um, kind of idea, this unity, that how we might understand these different phenomenons, um, that while there is a basic general reality that, that Deloria uh, explores in the book, The World We Used to Live In. So if you haven't read that book, this might be a book, good book for you to read. Um, he cautions us that also to remember how uniquely situated we are in our territories, including our unique languages. So our languages evolve from the plants. Our languages evolve from the water. Our languages evolve from our land. Our songs evolve from speaking to the plants and the plants speaking to us. And our use of the plants evolved from things such as dreams that would come and instruct our elders on how to use the plants and in what appropriate time. Uh, well, there's a common, uh, there's a, a phrase that you might've heard, all my relations, and it's from the Lakota people. And, um, all my relations is said in a ceremony to honor the uh, not all, all relations. So the human, not only the human relations, but the four legged and the plant peoples and the waters and four elements. And also to uh, recognize that we will be praying for them as we pray for all of life. So let me go to the next slide. Oh, sorry. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about pro protocols, but let me just finish on this then. I just want to mention here, these are just another example of the, um, uh, oh, I guess I should have stayed down there. This is first man and first woman and they're carrying tobacco and corn to see. And so these are other depictions then of how ceremony is integrated in with the plants. So these then these um, these protocols are how we ask for permission to use our plants. So this is an example of a protocol. And so when we start to think about all our relations, it helps us to understand how plants have peoplehood because we call them in as our relations. In fact, Deloria mentions one chief who refused to sign the Treaty of Walla Walla because he felt that all of creation was not represented in the quote unquote transaction. In the archival records, uh, there are prayers documented in my, among my Nahua people of the sacred tobacco. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. And here we see in here, there's uh, on the, um, I guess, left side of the image is the first, first elder praying with the tobacco. But the tobacco has different names depending on how we use it. So it could have the physical name Yip, or it had a ceremonial name that would be invoked in ceremony. And it was in that ceremonial name that a power emerged through the ceremonial calling of its, uh, of its, of its role and purpose. And it transferred, a, trans, uh, it's translated as not, in, one, uh, in one community, it translated as the nine times beaten one. And we know that because a priest in the 1500s who was trying to eradicate the teachings went around at persecuting the people for their knowledge so that he could determine what was happening and report them to the Inquisition. He kind of had his own Inquisition. Actually, he didn't even go to the Holy Inquisition, quote unquote, Holy Inquisition. He was doing his own personal Inquisition. So these are just, um, examples of the, of the relationship with earth and time. But one of the things I want to mention is the relationship of trees in the, um, 
me see if I can find the, um, here we go. So trees represent the connection between the vertical and the horizontal. They often represent, uh, for many Native peoples, uh, the tree of knowledge, uh, something very, I think, um, in many cultures, such as in the Christian culture. This is a sacred tree of the Maguey, and you see Maguey's all over Tucson. And this is the spirit of the Maguey, and she's sitting on top of a turtle and a, um, a snake, representing the fertility of the earth. But again, to talk about the intricacy of plants and what they bring to us, and how we understand their power is their, their connection then to creating our accurate calendars. And you know, the Mayan calendar is pretty, uh, they recognize it being pretty, pretty, pretty close in, uh, to the measurement of the Gregorian calendar. Um, on the right of this image is another tree of life in which a, a, a leader is emerging. And we see the tree personified with an eye, it's a seeing tree. And so there's a, there, in these Im images uh, from Mesoamerica, we see trees that hold up the four quadrants of the universe. And so there's a recognition that the trees have a certain uh, direction of, um, of a multi-directional kind of influence on life. The sacred knowledge, um, that harnesses this power, whether they be in plants or the water, was not the domain for everyone in a community. Although we might we can participate in numerous ceremonies, there are often people who have specialized knowledge and they become known as, uh, in English, the medicine people. We don't normally call them shamans. That's the word that was applied now from anthropology. Uh, we have words for these medicine people and they can be very intricate referring to how they keep dreams or how they work at the night or what the, when they work with a particular medicine but often they they refer to people who were what we would consider today something like a holy um, they had accumulated knowledge over time as elders to have a certain purity of the spirit because to work with these elevated realms in ceremony means you have to have a lot of strictness and discipline to go into that spiritual world and come back safe or to take someone into that spiritual world and have them not lose their faculties in this when they return into the physical world or to work with a plant that we today in English would consider to be hallucinogenic. There are ceremonies and songs that I don't want to say neutralize, but that allow a plant such as Tolowatzin, its original word in Nahuatl, or Tolowache in Spanish, or Jimson weed in English, uh, so that someone would not lose uh, their faculties and they would return from having experienced this medicine. This is similar to peyot which mean, in Nahuatl means that which glitters, heart that glitters, or what now we know today is peyote. I don't have peyote here. <laughs> um, and so through the ceremonies and the songs and the ceremonial language, often a language that is not known by everyone in a community, these particular keepers of knowledge could protect and protect people so that they can interact with these medicines, these high powers and the high spirits, or to elicit uh, an even higher power from a plant that you might think is ornamental and you might even have bought at a nursery. But a native person, if it's one of their original plants, it could be in fact a ceremonial medicine that would be used in a particular way in particular ceremonial time or for particular ceremonial purpose. And this, this continues today. So I'm not divulging things. These are things that are already in the record, okay? So one example then of uh, why there's a concern around cultural appropriation or inappropriate use of these plants is not only because of cultural appropriation, but of uh, protection for someone who might live with these plants. So I already talked about uh, plants and peoplehood. Um, 
these are just concepts from other peoples. I would like to go, here we go. One example of how we understood the, how to stay in balance with a plant that had great power was to, is tobacco. And this is from a Mayan glyph from one of the codices. And they're offering tobacco. I'll show you the entire glyph. This is the actual glyph that it's from. Uh, so tobacco could be used to uh, balance the prayers in the universe, or they can be used to open the door. And this is a depiction of a Mayan ceremony eater that is um, getting ready to use tobacco to doctor and to purify uh, someone who needs to be restored in balance. So tobacco was understood then to open the doors to uh, another level of human experience. And now today we see that tobacco, of course, we know when we think of tobacco and I teach students to think and look at, look at tobacco, what do they think of? And the first thing they think of is cancer. But we knew and that we, we didn't smoke it ceremonially. People smoked it to seal an agreement, to ask for permission to ask for protection, to, um, to lift negative forces or a negative experience off of someone. They were used in very respectful ways and in very limited ways we understood it was not something that was to be used recreationally. So our plants were not used recreationally. And we, had a lot of, we have a lot of discipline in our communities around this. So this is an example of from this, about the late 1700s of someone doctoring. And what I tell students when I have them look at this is that how we start to understand that plants must be understood within an environmental system. So for this medicine man to have this gourd, when did he gather that gourd? What kind of gourd is it? What kind of songs were sung? What's in that pot? Why is there a hide there? How was that hide gathered? What prayers were said to that? What's the spirit of the animal? Why does, this, why does that spirit of the animal, what role does it have in healing? When was this birch? And in what way and in what season um, and, and with what prayers was this uh, for structure made and what did that structure represent? Because all of those things, all of those questions had to be answered by someone in order to doctor someone effectively. And these are why there are environmental systems of knowledge. So then this raises the question. So we have now um, an effort to um, recognize legally personhood of our waterways, of uh, the great Hashan, the Atham, say the great Sawados, the Hashan, our people. In Australia, they, um, people will author with the name of the river or the mountain, uh, scholars. I was part of a book where they did this to honor the peoplehood of that place where they emerged. In New Zealand, uh, they've, they've recognized, uh, uh, the uh, Maori have gotten a, a, one of their great rivers recognized as having legal peoplehood among, uh, by, the, uh, um, by uh, the, government official, the government of New Zealand. So then if people have pe peoplehood, there becomes a tension when it's taken into a secular realm or a clinical realm outside of the peoplehood that it first emerged from. And I want to talk a little bit about this. So this is actually a, a pre-Columbian statue that shows the sacred mushroom, the sacred peyotzin, the sacred uh, tobacco flowers. Um, and so it's, it's uh, this was Xochipili, who was a guardian that um, was, had uh, some uh, authority related to these plants. There's a story. Uh, these are just sh actually showing you some of the uh, post-conquest, post post-invasion, um, the depiction re related to the mushrooms and to flowers. And this is an example of some of the protocols that people had. There was so much respect for them that you, when you gathered certain flowers of a bouquet, there was a certain way to approach those flowers out of respect for them. You wouldn't just go and, you know, we want to smell of the, the, the sweet smells of a rose you wouldn't normally, you wouldn't just do that. Uh, you had to approach them a certain way because the power uh, that today we would call volatile oils was recognized as having a spirit. And so we wouldn't intrude on that spirit. And so these were the kinds of protocols that have been left to us. 
And, and there is accounts as, um, as we go through the literature about what happens as people start to interact with plants that have been normally ceremonially, ceremonial contained within a culture. And so there's an account uh, from one of the books on Maria Savina. And Maria Savina was a Mistec uh, medicine keeper who introduced Wasserman, the anthropologist uh, Wasserman, to the sacred um, mushrooms. And one of the accounts that the relatives say later is that after Wasserman records these uh, prayers that Maria Savina um, gave to him, that the, what they called los niños or the little children or the sacred mushroom began to sing differently and sound differently. They had been changed by who had absorbed them, absorbed them now and what had been observed from outside of that culture. And this is how they perceived that. So I personally have been called uh, by people because they have had a bad trip, basically, working with people who uh, are, are um, doing ceremonies with the peyote or with the ayahuasca or um, in, and not properly trained. And these people um, have not felt that they have come back to their center. And so this is the implications of what happens when we um, do not have the appropriate training uh, to uh, know what to do when, because that, that is definitely a possibility with the power of these plants. In 1970, the Haudenosaunee chief, Orrin Lyons, uh, went to testify before the United Nations, and he said, who will speak for the natural world? Therefore, if we recognize that plants have peoplehood with their own um, rights, then who, as researchers, who consents for them? How do you gain consent when you're going on to um, a native land which at the University of Arizona, we are required, it's much, in the United States, we have reservations with American Indian peoples, but uh, in the global South and South of, the, of Mexico, they are de decentralized indigenous communities in the millions, thousands of individual villages with individual authorities. So one can imagine, I as a Nahua person, there's 1.5 officially recognized Nahua peoples, there's probably more like 3 million not 1.5 million, but 3 million just in Mexico alone, just of the Nahua people. Bolivia has 60% of its population are indigenous. How do you gain permission? Let's say, if, let's say we're working with a medicine that is shared across various cultures and communities. How do you gain consent regarding the public use? Because there is this tension of what happens when the plants go then into a global market and then who who are those plants made for and how will they survive? And how are they changed being taken out of those communities? So this is a depiction again, this is uh, from uh, Yucatec Maya and it shows a, um, this is in Chichen Itza and it's showing a field, but with it underneath that field is a sacred umbilical cord, sacred placentas and sacred female beings that are holding up the fertility of the land. So, my question becomes, as we think about plants and consciousness, we have to think about how we interact with them and what are the relationships to guide as we interact with those plants and what are the implications of them becoming secularized or not having the appropriate treatment. Uh, and of course, it's very, um, in, when we're talking about millions of people around the Americas and thousands of communities, it's something that's, it's a question that uh, will be answered in very specific situations and in very specific contexts. There's a lot of ecotourism happening. Um, some may be with indigenous controlled entities. Uh, some, some researchers are following, uh, would be answering these questions in their research or not. And so then this has um, you know, implications that can also change how the medicine responds to us. So one of the things that Gregory, Dr. Kehita taught me was that knowledge can go away and it can return with the appropriate relations. This is just um, our, um, our, our, you know, our guidelines here at the University of Arizona. So I'm just mentioning that for those, who, uh, those of you who are researchers. So I went in, I'm sorry, I've got 28 minutes. I'm, I'm gonna wrap it up. Our journey 
as human beings is an extraordinary one. And we're taught as indigenous peoples that we need to have sacrifice so that our minds can get out of the way for the accepted experience that we are used to, that it's that journey to struggle that in fact is what brings us the insight. But only some people may have access to certain medicines. But all of us have a human journey to struggle and the plants help us, the water helps us. We return to those four elements. When we, when we are born, we are constituted with the four elements. And then we return to the water, we return to the fire, we return to the earth, we return to the wind. But our journey as humans for indigenous peoples is to experience the wisdom to give back to our communities. And though while we might have that individual experience, it is to bring our communities forward. I happen to be a Buddhist also. And so uh, one of our teachings, I practice Nichiren Buddhism, is, is says to, to um, embrace the profound and relinquish the, the uh, superficial. And I found this quote that Vine Deloria, he, he quoted the Sioux elder shooter in the world we used to live in. And he says, we must seek the genuine and avoid the artificial. And that really is, um, I think it's interesting how uh, now, and I, 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 there's, this, there's this balance with the greater good of, uh, of, of someone in great need that perhaps needs a, a, a medicine like the ayahuasca. I know some of my colleagues are using the ayahuasca for people with depression. And maybe that can be the only medicine that can help them. But then there are others that can make that journey and they don't need to participate in an inappropriate relationship to find that very extraordinary experience of being human. That's why I think uh, mindfulness is such an important experience. There's also a concept that I like to end here and it, it translated in English as the great mystery. So our teachings recognize these different names for creation. In Nahuatl, there was one word, one phrase, all that we live for that which is close and near. But this great mystery is that it is a mystery. Not all things will be knowable. Not all things are meant to, not all things will translate even into a human language. And what we know from a native language, there are things that can never be translated into another English or Spanish language. There will be just translations of interpretations of experience. And sometimes things are only meant to be experienced. And that's part of the mystery. So there will always be things not knowable. But the purpose of this knowing is to be in movement. It's to be like Mali Nali, crisscrossing and providing movement for a possibility, for a potential. And we don't know sometimes what that end is, but in a native community, the end is to preserve and to continue as people. Thank you. Wow. Uh, I thought that there would be some dovetailing between Deepak and Patricia, but I had no idea how tightly dovetailed these different traditions are. And uh, I think that Patrice's ideas about uh, plant consciousness and consciousness of all uh, entities of our world um, are going to be brought forward now by Rajneesh in a scientific experimental approach to uh, remove consciousness from plants. So if any of you are vegans, you should see me after the session. If you're worried about the pain you're causing your plants when you eat them, I have uh, solutions. 
that I can offer for that. Um, but seriously, what uh, Rajneesh and I were interested in um, was the uh, orchestrated objective reduction theory of Stuart Hameroff and, and Sir Penrose um, that posits that microtubules, which are found throughout life forms, um, all cellular organisms, uh, certainly eukaryotes, some prokaryotes, utilize microtubules. And for the longest time, um, biologists thought of these as structural proteins that give cells their shape and form and allow them to divide into uh, new cells. But uh, more recently, uh, people are beginning to question their uh, functions beyond pure structure. And that's central to the uh, orchestrated objective reality theory of consciousness that the uh, microtubules are like waveguides that allow and facilitate the uh, objective reduction part of the theory where uh, so objective reduction is just a particle can be in two places at once or it can have an up spin or a down spin or it can be charmed or not um, all these different things at the subatomic level when we measure them or they go into a situation that freezes their identity that causes a collapse of the wave function. So the wave function says it can be this or that, could be anywhere in the universe, but when it's pinned down to where it actually is and what it actually is, that collapses the uh, wave function to Schrodinger um, uh, aspects of quantum mechanics. And from that, a quantum of consciousness is generated. So um, the universe is full of things that are collapsing. In our brains right now, millions of particles are uh, collapsing uh, in every moment. And when you have enough accumulation of conscious uh, um, elements, then you feel consciousness. So let's get to microtubules in plants. They're critical for plants to survive just as they are for ourselves to survive. So Rajneesh and I thought, well, if the uh, orchestrated objective reduction theory is true, then if we can treat microtubules with anesthetics at concentrations that we know block consciousness in us, we should see an effect on uh, any microtubule system. We chose uh, microtubules in plants because they're much easier to measure than in our brain cells. So Rajneesh is gonna describe some experiments that mostly he's done. I've I'm kind of the consultant, but uh, um, that adds support to the objective reduction hypothesis of consciousness. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, such uh, wonderful talks uh, to begin with. Uh, and we explored the possibilities of consciousness, uh, the uniting, united consciousness, the cosmos consciousness, uh, all these ideas uh, tell us that there is more to consciousness than we might think. So ju just to explore that a little bit, uh, I'd like to start with, uh, if you just uh, try to close your eyes, you don't have to, but point is to imagine that you're walking on the beach and you'll feel, you'll actually, your body will feel certain um, a difference that as if you're on the beach, if you're really imagining it. Or if you, if you think um, you're holding your favorite fruit, 
mango or apple, whatever it is, then, then your body will feel like, okay, I want to take bite out of it, out of this. So how is this working? It's because when you had those experiences, there was memory created, there was information that was given to you uh, through your experience. When you were at the beach, beach gave you some information. This is my characteristic. This is my smell. This is the sound. And it's so wonderful that you can close your eyes and experience it again. So I'm a photobiologist. And when I say information, that's what I mean. With information, uh, for example, if we take light, uh, light carries information. Which direction is the light coming from? What color is it? How in, what is the intensity of the light? How, what, how long was the light duration? And it's not just us who can tell that. Plants can tell that as well. So plants can tell which direction the light is coming from, what color it is, what is the duration? And the duration changes through seasons. So now we are, now we are getting into the depths of understanding uh, information. So that is the information that when I say information, that's what I mean. So let's take a step back, all the way back to the Big Bang. Now we're at the Big Bang. And one, is the, one of the most interesting aspects of our current understanding of the, how the universe started is that there was this period from 10 to, power of, 10 to the power of minus 36 to 10 to the power of minus 32 seconds when inflation happened. And uh, this is an accepted uh, theory, and we, we believe that very soon after the Big Bang, the universe inflated and became larger. It's expanding, and it continues to expand, which is very well established. But that inflation part early on uh, is, is a little bit, you know, uh, theoretical. And uh, on the other side, I'm sh uh, showing uh, Sir Roger Penrose's uh, conformal cyclic cosmology idea. Uh, which uh, does not require that inflation. So uh, uh, if you have heard him uh, give a talk on this, uh, obviously I'm just going to summarize and I don't understand all the math. Uh, I'm a biologist, but conformal is a space. Like if you have a small chessboard or you have a larger chessboard, proportionately uh, you are in the same, uh, same uh, place. So if a universe uh, for example, goes through one cycle, as he says, it takes an eon. And after the universe, uh, through its one cycle, there is a, a black hole and all the, all the information. Now you know what I mean by information. All the information that was in that universe is going into the black hole. Then Hawking's radiation, which is also well established, is converting that information and the, uh, this radiation comes out and turns into photons. So at the end of this one universe, all we have left is photons. And this is information. And if this information emerges and uh, starts another universe, according to the cyclic cosmology, then that information, some form of that information, perhaps is carried through into the next universe. So that, that's one idea that I wanted to uh, implant, that there is information and there is a possibility that the universe is cyclic and that there is information that could be transferred from one to the next universe. Now, if we look a little bit closer uh, to the, uh, our uh, Big Bang theory and then going all the way to where we see formation of the solar system, it says 9 billion years after the Big Bang. And today we are at 13.77 billion years. So the age of the earth, we think is about 4.5 billion years old. And our first, we think our first evidence of life on earth was 3.8 billion years ago, which means that it took less than 1 billion years for life to appear on this planet. And as Deepak mentioned, uh, how many planets are there? How many galaxies are there? there, there and is it possible that there is life on other planets? If it took only uh, less than 1 billion years, for life to appear on this planet? Well, I'm going to leave that as an open question for us to ponder. But what I'm going to uh, actually uh, talk more about is the connection between life and what we uh, call consciousness. And how can we explore that further? So if we, if we uh, follow this trend, 
about 2.7 billion years billion years ago we we think uh, we found trace fossils so not actual fossils but traces of fossils and we think those were eukaryotic which means multicellular so prokaryotic um, life may have started 3.8 billion years ago and then a life uh, got more complex 1.6 billion years ago we think there there is possibly a common ancestor between plants and animals and that's when plants plant development went into one direction and animal development went into another direction we actually have uh, fossils of eukaryotic foss uh, cellular fossils uh, from 0.6 billion years ago and we are here at present which is a very very tiny portion just to give you a perspective this is when the dinosaurs disappeared uh, 65 million years ago so if you look at the whole whole scheme uh, life has been on on the planet for a very long time and now we if you think about the differences between plants and animals we can tell that the logic of development has been the same and this is adapted from um, dr marovitz's uh, publication in science in 2002 so logic of development means if you if you look at the patterning of development in plants and animals if you look at uh, what what things went into developing sexual reproduction and attracting um uh, mates or colors and smells those logic those logical things during development were common between plants and animals what was different the differences were the molecules and the arrangement or we now are learning as we do our science the how the molecules are arranged during this development are different however these are all still following the same program same structures ancient protein domains these are proteins that that came uh, were used even by the single cell that came alive uh, 3.8 billion years ago so the same structures same proteins same uh, instruments are being used just arranged in a different way to create the same patterns of development in plants and animals so uh, dr marovitz um, concludes that plants represent a proper comparison to animals to study developmental processes and like uh, uh, dr mckayver said we can use plants to understand many of the uh, mechanisms that are harder to study in humans so now if we take a step back another step back and think about what einstein told us about general theory of relativity uh, that space time is one thing so now all of this development is occurring in space time so every every plant every human every animal this development whether it be in one direction of the plants or animals it's occurring in space time so i'm going to take all of us to a, a little journey and we are going to look a little bit deeper into what does this mean about development occurring in space time space time according to minkowski's space time is actually four dimensional and we know that so x y and z dimensions and then the fourth dimension is time i can stand here and not move in one dimension i may not move in x dimension or y and z i am at one spot but i can never stop myself from moving in the dimension of time it's always continuously moving and so development is connected to that movement we cannot stop it we we continuously age so time is moving development is occurring another interesting thing which is uh, uh, fascinating to me if you look at a seedling on the seedling that is grown in the dark that is etiolated we call it etiolated or the one that has not yet seen light and it grows uh, elongated it gets taller and taller and taller because it's coming through the soil it's trying to look for light because if it does not find light it won't be able to photosynthesize and won't survive so it has to have light once it does see light or if it sees light early on it won't get elongated you can see that the one growing in uh, in yellow or in the light it has not elongated as much it's shorter but it has developed cotyledons or leaves and those leaves are green so it can photosynthesize but here's what fascinates me the most every single cell every single molecule in that cell is developing is moving forward in that minkowski space time so as an organism whether it be humans or animals or the seedling 
somehow that development is coordinated. So if you think of space time and imagine it being pixelized, like when you print a picture on in your printer, every single pixel is working together to give you that image of that seedling. And that seedling is developing through space time. So on Earth, like I said, there might be life on other planets, we don't know. Uh, but at least on Earth, what does a seedling or a plant need? And we also have our own needs, but we need a plant needs air, the right temperature, the water and nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium and PK. Gravity is holding it uh, on the planet. Otherwise, maybe it's flying out into, <laughs> into the space. But then um, I think there is something missing in this picture. And I, I call that a hidden signal. And I think uh, the need for that hidden signal is that there needs to be something that's driving that development at that space time um, pixel. There, need, the, there is some directionality into this development that ultimately coordinates. Light, as we can see, is not necessary. The, the development can still occur in the absence of light. So light is needed only for providing energy and going to uh, the place where it can become autotrophic or it can make the seedling can make its own food. But in the meantime, uh, there is some need for that hidden signal. So if you look at a chart like this, uh, light we express as lambda with that symbol. And so luckily uh, I was looking to see what I could call this hidden signal. And I, um, uh, Aleph was fortunately available. These days it's very hard to find uh, names and symbols. Aleph actually is the first letter of the very first alphabet, um, uh, uh, Abrajat. And actually it all also has roots in Sanskrit language. So it's the very first letter in any language that we can go back to. And so I, I called it Aleph and it's symbolic. It's some information that exists in that very small pixel of space time. And I, I, the only thing I can add to that is that it must have properties of light. So it is something that we cannot detect yet, at least. It's undetected, but it's present constantly. And it has, at least it moves at the speed of light. And I'll, I'll tell you why. So here's the present. We are always in the present. Every pixel of space time is always in the present. Like Dr. Uh, Chopra said, there might be memories you know, that, that you can remember, you, but you're always in the present. And if we, if we call that information quantum information, just to make it more at the quantum level, although we are talking about even less below sub, sub quantum level. So the quantum information of sub quantum information. And one thing that I want to implant here and again, is that at the very end, pixel, this information that I'm calling Aleph, let's say that it, it is a stem cell type of information. It can take any physical form. It can become living or non-living or any physical form. Okay, now, if that information started to take form on this planet under those conditions that I just described, it adapted itself to create that first cell which could survive and develop. And as it developed, it took other forms. So what is consciousness? This is my uh, definition of consciousness and I, I particularly uh, wanted to bring this up because the, the rest of the talk that I'll uh, present, it will distinguish between this. So consciousness is the ability of the developed physical form as it's developing to interrelate with the inherent quantum information in varied degrees of self-awareness. So whether the single cell organism that first be, uh, came to presence, whether that cell was self-aware or not, we don't know. We know that we are self-aware. Are plants self-aware? We don't know. However, consciousness is the ability to interrelate with this information that's at the very pixel level in space-time. So a physical form is a functional coordination of accumulated microspace, constrained in performance by its own physical properties. So if that information is the stem cell, has the ability to become anything, as a physical form is developed, it is constrained then by its own properties. It loses the ability to become any cell, just like a stem cell would. 
So uh, that's that point of information that I'm uh, that I'm referring to. I call Aleph. So uh, now if we take the next step, just to make things simpler, it's always good to give some terms or new ways to define things. So I call this the smallest pixel of space a spot on. A spot on is the smallest pixel, which is the size of Planck scale, is the smallest uh, thing that, that can occur in space. For example, a photon is 3.49 into 10 to the power of minus 11 meters. So a photon will have many spot ons. Okay? And this, you can see at present, there is a spot on, which is present in a photon. So in one second, because a photon moves at that speed, 10.99 10 into 10 to the power of eight meters, the photon will experience that much of new space, new information in that space. And in half a second, it will be immersed in what was going to happen in that, in that space, right? So, so functionally, information-wise, a photon with its own properties is going to move into new space. Now, photon itself has space inside. So there is an intrinsic space and there's an extrinsic space. And now, as the photon is moving through the extrinsic space, if you compare to sound, uh, speed of sound, it will cover or it will experience much less of the extrinsic space. So I call this the theory of spatial relativity. So each, each form has an intrinsic space, intrinsic, intrinsic information, and the extrinsic information. And based on its own mass and speed, it's going to experience that information relatively differently. So this is the theory of spatial relativity. And the, an, another aspect to remember as we move forward is that the whole space that is intrinsic, uh, just as atoms make molecules, spotons make sporticules. So a sporticule is all the intrinsic space that's inside any form, whether it's a plant, animal, rock, earth, uh, galaxy, a sporticule is the cumulative information that is in the intrinsic form of space. So another aspect then we can add to that is that this particle is influenced or entrained by what's outside. So as we uh, wake up in the morning and go to sleep, there are external um, influences that entrain how we are going to act, what we're going to do now. So it's, it's an interaction of the intrinsic space with the extrinsic space in the given environment. So that paints the, uh, the picture. Now we move into how can we relate that to uh, consciousness? So isoflurane is, is an anesthetic. And like uh, Dr. McIver mentioned, we use the, that anesthetic to see how plants respond to an anesthetic. And we did this experiment. Uh, of course, uh, applying anesthesia to plants is nothing new. Uh, it's been done since uh, 19th century. Uh, but it has never been done. So uh, many times it's been looked uh, at uh, with like uh, mimosa plants or Venus fly, and it's more of a physical or a growth test. We decided to, based on what I just presented, we, we decided to test whether we can block the ability of the seedling to respond to an environmental signal, which is light. So you can see on the top where there is no anesthesia, seedlings are bending towards blue light. Blue light is on that one direction. By the way, seedlings only bend towards blue light. They don't bend towards any other color of light. Not to red, not to green, only blue light. So white light also contains blue light. So uh, the next day, we put those seedlings under a white light, which was on top. So you can see on the, on the top panel, they bend towards blue light. And then next day, they're growing towards the white light. As we increase the amount of anesthesia or isoflurane, uh, we, we can see that in the uh, second and third uh, on the fourth panel, they do not bend anymore. But when we transferred them the uh, next day, they, were, they had recovered. So for the six to eight hours while they were under anesthetic, they did not bend. But then the next morning, they had come back and they were uh, bending or growing towards the white light. But we, as we can see in the very bottom panel, there was an, uh, that concentration was much higher and they were not able to recover. So when we measure this, um, you can see that the uh, straight growing seedling is at 180 degrees. And as they bend, it's more of a 90 degrees. So uh, this is a graph 
uh, showing that as we increase the concentration of the anesthetic, uh, the bending was blocked by the anesthetic. And what was interesting is that volume by volume, this effect was similar to uh, the uh, concentrations that are used for loss of consciousness in humans, and also the surgical uh, anesthesia MAC, which is, uh, which is at a concentration where you can do surgery and the patient will not feel anything. And that's the concentration where the plants were not responding the next day. But the range was within the concentrations that are used uh, for humans. So now the next question was, well, did they lose the ability to respond to light? Well, we can test that in plants. And this is why I think it's in, uh, interesting to work with plants. There is a photoreceptor known as phytochrome and phytochrome B absorbs red light. So we tested phytochrome B uh, mutant. So these plants are uh, lacking the function of phytochrome B, but just to uh, cut the long story short, uh, the phytochrome B mutants also were blocked by anesthesia. So that means the function of phytochrome B was not required for the anesthesia to block this response. So, uh, so we continue to study this further. And what was interesting again, was that the, the anesthetic worked was more effective in light. So as you can see on the top two graphs, the Columbia is the wild type version uh, or has all the genes working and uh, phytochrome B is the mutant. And we can see that the orange and the pink uh, on the top two graphs, the orange uh, is lower than the blue, which is an untreated. But when we look at the lower graphs, the orange is closer to the blue. So when these seedlings were growing in the dark, anesthesia did not have as much of an effect. And that told us something very important because seedlings grow very differently in dark and in light. In the dark, they are simply elongating. During the light, when the growth happens, there is lots of new genes are expressed and proteins have to be reformed. There's a lot more activity. So seedling is responding to the environment. In other words, the, our preliminary data is suggesting that anesthesia blocks the ability to respond to the environment while maintaining basic survival mechanism both in plants and animals, because we know that in animals under anesthesia, the heart is beating, everything is going on. The thing, one thing that is blocked is the ability to respond to the environment. So if there is information constantly coming in, then something was blocked. And if that is true for plants and animals, then I was looking for what might be a common pathway that goes back to the common ancestor. And I came to this shikimic acid pathway, which is a very uh, prokaryotic, uh, you know, ancient pathway. And I don't know, uh, you know, you know you might, most of you might know, we don't make tryptophan, the amino acid, our bodies don't make tryptophan, we have to get it from our food. And any, uh, plants make tryptophan and chloroplasts, which also has origins uh, through pro prokaryotic um, uh, origins. So that means that tryptophan is made uh, by bacterial cells in old pathway. So if we now look at what light does, light acts to block the conversion of tryptophan into hormones, like in plants, one hormone is auxin. If we don't have, if the plants don't have auxin, they will not elongate. So auxin seems to be linked to the dark adaptation or the cell elongation, the dark response or dark growth, uh, growth in the dark. When the light comes on, it acts through the photoreceptor and it blocks that conversion of tryptophan to auxin. So the proposal is, the, uh, my proposal is that there is an etoreceptor and whether that etoreceptor is, is tryptophan or not, uh, it, it's possible and tryptophan is present in microtubules as well. And plants, uh, when they're bending towards light, they reorganize microtubules. So we are testing that uh, hypothesis, whether those tryptophan amino acids on the microtubules are playing a role. And we are actually, this experiment is going on this week. So we're excited about that. But then there is the hidden signal Aleph that may be perceived by the CTO receptor that controls everything, except that when the light comes on, it suppresses that pathway and changes the direction of development. And this is true for humans as well. In human brain, tryptophan is converted to a serotonin and melatonin, which are also uh, hormones that work in the dark. So plants, excel in using light to create stored energy or food. 
And animals excel in using, let's say, information aleph to create thoughts. Now, I just wanted to uh, spend um, you know, a few seconds on this. So if we think of this a little bit carefully, the common ancestor, which we think possibly had, has those pathways, and uh, if consciousness is related to the tryptophan pathway, that makes sense because uh, most of the psychedelics, uh, they're, they are derived from aromatic amino acids, which includes tryptophan, phenylalanine, and these psychedelics work underneath the tryptophan pathway. So perhaps the anesthetic is blocking our ability to interact with this information, but then under psychedelics, that is at super drive. So now we have become more sensitive, like, like tobacco or other, other things, they can activate our connectivity or uh, uh, increase our connectivity to this information aleph, which is in the space-time realm. And so uh, if that's true, then we can actually say that just like photosynthesis is a process, consciousness is a process, which, which means I, that I'm separating the idea of consciousness, the term or the meaning of consciousness from information, which is space-time like Aleph. I think one could also say that that is consciousness as well. So Aleph can also be consciousness, but just to make this connection, I'm saying that consciousness is a process in any form. It's its ability to take information from ex extrinsic sources and utilize uh, energy and everything uh, that is available. And plants have, have the ability to convert that into food and uh, sugar or stored energy. Whereas animals, develop this ability to uh, use this information to create thoughts and reasoning. And this, is, this was important because plants develop the processes to produce food for all life on earth, including us, including for themselves. Animals developed processes to think plus ability to rationalize because that helped them survive. And so they, they could think of for themselves and, and take care of themselves. And for that, they became more self-aware, especially as they, we developed or animals developed to humans, we became more self-aware. Now we call that consciousness. So just to end this with a bigger thought, I just want you to uh, think about this as, as you go through this conference and, and go home. Plants are doing well on producing food for themselves and for us. How well are humans doing? on thinking and taking care of the planet. So with that, I'd like to just uh, thank uh, Dr. McIver for inviting me. And uh, also I look forward to the uh, panel discussion and uh, my collaborators, uh, Ulrich, Rena, and Grace. And we just recently started this podcast. Uh, it's a YouTube channel as well. It's called, called Terra Science, um, just about a month, uh, month and a half ago. And so you can find it on YouTube and wherever you like to listen podcasts. Um, and uh, that's, that's it. And I hand it over to Dr. McIver. Oh, before I leave, uh, because it is information and it is about interacting with the environment, I think meditation is really important. So I encourage all of you to come tomorrow at 8 a.m. I will be there to, uh, for meditation with Dr. Chopra. Thank you. Um, thank you, Rajneesh. Uh, I'll just add one comment to, to that, that uh, under a microscope, you can actually see the process of phototropism involving the disassembly and reassembly of microtubules. And this is a, an aspect we're uh, looking at now in, in the current experiments. And We've ruled out virtually every other protein system in the plant being affected by the anesthetic. It's not the light sensing proteins because uh, the anesthetics work in the dark. It's not the energy because the growth still works in the dark. 
So uh, we're getting down now to uh, maybe just microtubules, but remains to be seen. Our uh, last speaker today is uh, Dennis McKinnon. He's going to be joining us uh, remotely, but he's an expert on how plants alter our consciousness. And uh, we kind of wrap things around 180 degrees. Dennis? Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. McIver and uh, everyone. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, well, I'll, I'll assume that you can. Uh, what a wonderful uh, series of lectures. I mean, this, this forum has covered uh, a great variety of topics from all sorts of perspectives. So it's been, it's been a pleasure listening to these. I hope that, that uh, mine fits in here somewhere. And, uh, and then we can go on into the discussion. So uh, I've got a couple of things. Uh, well, I need some, I need to share my screen. If somebody can let me do that, let me try to, to do that. And uh, well, it looks like that works. Okay. So here goes. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I, uh, let me see, can we, okay, that's good. Get rid of that little thing. So uh, my talk is plant intelligence and the guy in mind, I, I guess I misunderstood the topic of consciousness, but intelligence is, you know, not really separable from consciousness. So, so this is uh, what I'm going to talk about. I want to first draw your attention to the McKenna Academy and the Hefter Research Institute. I'm affiliated with both of those. The McKenna Academy is organizing a big conference in the UK uh, in May. Uh, this will be my only plug. It's called ESPD 55. And if you look at ESPD55.com on the web, it'll all come up. And some of you may be interested in that. The ESPD 50, ESPD 50, or ESPD stands for uh, the Ethnopharmacologic Search for Psychoactive Drugs. And so I'm basically an ethnopharmacologist, but not going to talk about much of that here. What I am going to talk about is the Gaia hypothesis, some aspect of that, the concept that the earth is alive, that the earth is our mother, is found in the most ancient traditions. And it's self-evidently true. The earth, Gaia, in other languages and traditions, is the cradle of all life on earth, including her most problematic species, the human race. The invention of the Gaia hypothesis, the scientific approach to the Gaia hypothesis, rather than through myth and, uh, and religion, the, was the notion that Gaia is a living organism belongs to James Lovelock, who was a geochemist, and his 1979 book, Gaia, A New Look at Life on Earth, argues that the biosphere, the entire community of life on Earth, actively modulates the global ecosystem to keep planetary conditions within the relatively narrow limits that are optimum for life, or at least tolerable for life. And when he brought this idea forward, it was... Uh, ridiculed by many, now it's pretty well accepted that life does actively modulate uh, planetary processes and, and make the earth inhabitable, basically. So I have a the clip here. The of the moon, the astonishing thing about the earth catching the breath is that 
it is alive. The photographs show the dry, pounded surface of the moon in the foreground, dry as an old bone, aloft, floating free beneath the moist, gleaming membrane of bright blue sky is the rising Earth, the only exuberant thing in this part of the cosmos. If you could look long enough, you would see the swirling of the great drifts of white cloud, covering and uncovering the half-hidden masses of land. If you had been looking for a very long geologic time, you could have seen the continents themselves in motion, drifting apart on their crustal plates, held afloat by the fire beneath. It has the organized, self-contained look of a live creature, full of information, marvelously skilled in handling the sun. Okay, well, that did seem to work. I hope you could all hear it. So Lovelock introduced the concept of geophysiology, the idea that the major parts of the biospheric geophysiology in consists of the atmosphere, the geosphere, the earthly part, sometimes called the lithosphere, the hydrosphere, and the biosphere. This is all pretty much accepted, uh, uh, you know, uh, planetary science. And just as the functions of the body work together through complex homeostatic lead feedback loops, these biosphere level systems are similarly regulated. So the biosphere, the living part of this system actively intervenes to keep critical parameters within the limits that life can tolerate. There are many of these variables, but some of the primary ones are the temperature, the salinity and the pH of the oceans the composition of the atmosphere, obviously important, the amount of carbon dioxide and oxygen and other gases in the atmosphere, and the surface temperature of the planet. All of these uh, are characterized by these interacting feedback loops. And the biota, the living part of this system, is really exercising the regulatory control. So. That's really what we mean that when we say the earth is alive, it works like an organism. The life, life on the planet is very actively modulating the functioning of this, of this planet-sized organisms. And the term for this is the super organism. It's a collection of organisms that exist as a single organism. There are lots of examples of this, anthills, termite colonies and beehives are some of the obvious ones. Uh, uh, naked mole rats, which are you know, hive-like colonies, except they're mammals. Coral reefs are superorganisms. Humans are superorganisms in the sense that much of our biomass is made up by of our microbiome, as much as 30% of the human bio of the human biomass is not genetically us. It's not genetically the self. It's these microbiome uh, colonies, populations, which are phylogenetically different depending on where they're found in the body. So humans are also superorganisms. And all of these superorganisms function due to three important processes, symbiosis. That's when two or more organisms live in close association, two or more species live in close association, often, not always, but very often in nature to mutual benefit. Homeostasis is the state of being in balance, a tendency to maintain constant internal conditions despite large changes in the external environment. And feedback is our information loops, information that informs the system about the internal state and external conditions and helps the, is essential to maintaining homeostasis. And planetary uh, balance and really in an organism, the balance of an organism all depend, 
you know, uh, when, when a system is in equilibrium and homeostasis, it's thriving. When that homeostasis is disrupted, as we as a species are now busily, you know, putting pressure on the homeostatic feedback loops that maintain the earth as a viable living system, then we get into trouble. But we're not going to go too far into that. So these feedback loops uh, is what is the mechanism that works here. And feedback occurs when elements of a system are routed back as part of a chain of cause and effect. And you could have very simple feedback systems such as the one on the left, A affects B and B in turn affects A. Or you can have somewhat more complex one where you get an input, some stimulus to uh, a process and there's an output there, you know, information goes in there, information comes out, but then some of the effects feed back on the process and affects it. So that's a more complex uh, feedback, feedback type loop. And this is all mediated through a process called signal transduction and biosemiotics. Homeostasis, the equilibrium at the organismic level and the biospheric level is maintained through feedback loops. And these work through signal transduction and biosemiotics. When it happens at the organismic level, we call it signal transduction. At the ecosystem, biospheric level, it's called sometimes biosemiotics, but the same idea. Information is transferred by these mechanisms, and it's a special kind of information transfer where it involves the transmission of information that are mediated by chemical messengers. For example, neurotransmitters in the brain or other types of internal signal transduction uh, uh, molecules. So it involves a messenger molecule that travels through space or internally travels somewhere and finds its receptor and binds to that molecule and, and produces a cascade type effect, a, a response. So Dennis, can you hear me? Yes. Um, we've lost your screen sharing, so we're not able to see your graphics. Mm, well, that's not good. Uh, can we reestablish it? I think if you push the green button. Okay. Okay, sorry about that. I'm not sure why that would be. Thank you for the heads up. Uh, uh, okay, can you see it now? Yes. Okay, can we get rid of the control button? Let me see, wait a minute. I, I know how to do this, hang on. Uh, hide floating meeting controls. That's how you do it. Okay, so are you telling me you couldn't see anything that I was showing so up to now? Yes, okay. We saw well, your first slide and then it disappeared when you shut off the controls. The controls don't really... Um, bother us much you can just go ahead we can see you and your slides now if you want to continue okay well i i could just plow ahead or i could try to uh i could i could try to back up a little but maybe that doesn't maybe that's not required i mean i i think that verbal explanation hopefully uh covered the topic i'm sorry about that these are the uh, these are the hazards of Zoom, you know. <laughs> uh, so we were talking about signal transduction and as information mediated by molecules, basically both internally in organisms and in the biosphere. And uh, in this is a this picture. If you can see this slide, is a a slice of the human genome. Uh, that shows the portion of the human genome 
devoted to signal transduction. About one eighth of the genome is but the codes for signal transduction uh, molecules and receptors. Receptors represent about 100, 120th of it. G protein coupled receptors, which are a uh, important group of uh, receptors, particularly in the nervous system, represent about 2% of the genome. And transporters, such as the serotonin transporters, about 1.7% of the genome. So signal transduction uh, processes are very important because essentially they, they supply the choreography that makes an organism exist in an organized fashion through space and time. You know, uh, organisms, we think of them as things, but they're actually processes. And, and what we see when we see a living thing is this very elegantly uh, orchestrated dance through space and time that makes it actually a living thing. That's all, that all happens because of signal transduction. So, uh, okay, I went to full screen. Hopefully everybody can still see that. Uh, so if we look at neural networks, uh, we can look at the brain is essentially a model, a, a very good model for signal transduction process. It's a biochemical machine specialized for signal transduction by neural transmission. And all of these brain's critical functions, including our experience of consciousness, are mediated by this neuronal communications network. And neurotransmitters in the brain are the small molecules that mediate this crosstalk between the neurons. And given the capabilities of neural imaging technology now, we can even open a window on the brain and watch this process in real time, which this is not animated, but if it were, you could see these processes taking place. So that's pretty cool. Uh, when Salvador Dali was asked where he got the ideas for his surrealist paintings, which this is not one of them, but where did he get the ideas for these crazy paintings? Someone said, well, are you on drugs? He said, I do not take drugs, I am drugs. I think this is a very profound statement because we are basically biochemical engines that run on drugs, hormones, neurotransmitters, other types of signal transducing molecules. So in a sense, uh, we are made of drugs and the drugs are these signal transducing molecules and the neurotransmitters in the brain and the plant messenger molecules evolved from the same evolutionary precursors and probably served similar functions. So it's not surprising that plants contain a panoply of neurotransmitter-like compounds that can act on brain receptors. You often encounter some similar molecules, sometimes the very same molecules that serve signal transduction functions in the ecosystem, as we'll see. So it comes to the question about plant intelligence. Uh, you monkeys only think you're running the show. This was a personal uh, telepathic transmission I received from ayahuasca many years ago uh, when I took, uh, took the medicine with the UDV. And uh, then I was treated to a molecules eye view of photosynthesis uh, in my visionary state, which was kind of an interesting uh, experience. And actually, was very influential to me, profoundly moved me and made me appreciate the miracle of photosynthesis, which we'll get to uh, in a minute. What do we mean by intelligence? Plant intelligence is a popular subject now to talk about. Well, on one, one definition, intelligence is a capacity for learning, reasoning, understanding, various forms of mental activity, such as abstract thought. We usually think of this as intelligence, but it is 
an anthropocentric definition, and it presumes that the brain is necessary for intelligence. Not necessarily so. Another definition is the ability to respond in optimal ways to the challenges presented by one's environment and circumstances. And plants are very good at this type of intelligence. Uh, and they don't have brains, of course. At least we haven't found any. Here's a good example. This is kind of an interesting plant. This is the so-called chameleon vine in the family Lardizabalaceae. You gotta love that term. So this vine is a climbing vine as vines tend to do. This plant has developed the ability to mimic the leaves in shape of any plant that it climbs upon, uh, including a plastic plant. The plant that it's climbing on doesn't even have to be a real plant. It will happily mimic the shape of, a, of an artificial plastic leaf if you grow it in proximity to it. Uh, th this shows a little bit about how, how this is. This is the, the vine and this is the leaf of the plant that it's growing on. Here's another iteration of that. This one is the vine and this one is the tree that it's growing on. This is called biomimetic polymorphism. And uh, it's very rare in nature, but it does occur. This particular plant is uh, uh, one of the few that can actually adapt to any other species. There, there are species of mistletoe that will do this if, if they're growing near other, other related species of mistletoe. This one seems to be able to adapt to any leaf shape that it encounters. It's really not very well understood how it does that. But I think that's pretty cool, just in the sense that you think plants are not intelligent? Well, they're not intelligent. This is a pretty neat trick. So signal transduction is the important factor in the ecosystem that maintains this ecological balance. Who needs brains? It turns out brains are not necessary for intelligence. What is required are what we call neural networks, and it, it's a misnomer. They should be called hyperconnected communications and feedback loops because there's no nervous system involved. Neural networks is a term that comes out of mathematics and the study of these things because that neural, neural systems is what we had to study. But it turns out that hyperconnected networks, these neural networks the size of ecosystems, regulate signal transduction in ecosystems and function similarly to neural networks in brains. So old growth forests, for example, are maintained by these so-called mother trees and, and they are connected to the entire forest through these complex mycorrhizal networks, uh, networks of fungi and root inter, roots interwoven. And there are signal transduction processes that are mediated throughout these ecosystem-sized neural networks. So the forest is essentially a large brain. You can think about it that way. And the mother trees, by exchanging information with the other trees, the fungi and bacteria in the soil and so forth, maintains the stability of the ecosystem. This work has been pioneered by a woman at the University of British Columbia named Suzanne Simard. Uh, she has written uh, many, many uh, scientific papers, peer-reviewed papers, and a very accessible and, and beautiful book called Finding the Mother Tree, Discovering the Wisdom of the Forest. Uh, she is a hard scientist. Uh, it, that is, she does hard science. When she first came out with this theory, she was ridiculed by her colleagues in the forest, uh, in the forestry department. They just dismissed this whole thing as new age nonsense. But she 
persisted and she kept she kept uh, publishing papers in journals like Nature, for example. And that kind of shut the critics up because they couldn't really, you know, they couldn't really find uh, that much wrong with her theory. And it, it ha actually has very much influenced the way that uh, forestry now understands how uh, these these forests should be managed because the old model used to be when you go to a forest you cut down the largest tree and that's what you do but uh, that's all changed due to her work anyway so plants let's talk about chemistry all plants are chemists because they've mastered this neat trick called photosynthesis and they have figured out how to capture the energy of light through light harvesting pigments. And they use that energy, sun, the energy of sunlight, water and carbon dioxide as precursors to make a vast array of organic compounds. And the, uh, they, this is the mechanism by which CO2 is sequestered out of the atmosphere. They capture CO2 and they incorporate it into organic substrates. And conveniently enough, they uh, excrete oxygen as a byproduct. And we happen to need oxygen to breathe. So it's a very complex balance. And this is the main mechanism, the sequestration of carbon dioxide into organic uh, matrices that maintains the the uh, balance of the gases in the atmosphere. And of course, we're putting strains on this system because we're emitting far more carbon dioxide than, than the plants can compensate for. Most of the organic compounds that come from photosynthesis are universal. They're the molecules of life, basically. But plants also make an enormous array of so-called secondary compounds in the yellow boxes here. There's nothing secondary about these. They're not essential for life because they don't occur in all living things. But for the plants that they occur in, usually the, and this is characteristic of certain families and so on, uh, they do serve a, serve a, a very important function. And they're very important to us too. For example, the nitrogen containing secondary products such as alkaloids are the source of very important medicines. The uh, monoterpenoids are sources of fragrance and many, many other useful compounds, medicines and, and substances of all sorts of economic importance. But the plants use these, these are the signal transduction language of plants, if you will. Plants, they don't exhibit behavior in the sense that animals do. They can't run away. They can't escape from their predators. They're stuck in the ground. They respond to it through chemistry. Essentially, they use these messenger molecules to mediate relations with other organisms, which include other plants and fungi, microorganisms, in the environment, in the soil, insects, you know, insect pollination biology is totally mediated through these signal transduction uh, processes with plant secondary compounds, with herbivores, things that might want to nibble on the plants, and that includes us, of course. And and they use these, these compounds for simple, uh, more or less straightforward applications, such as defense, where the message is basically stay away, you know, they produce repellents and toxins. It gets more interesting though, when they send, have a semiotic function, a signaling function, and often the signal or the message they're sending, if you will, is don't stay away, come closer. Let's form symbiosis. Let's symbiose together and create alliances. And these alliances you know, benefit both the plants and whatever they're symbi symbiosing with. And this is all mediated through signal transduction processes. So essentially these plant secondary compounds are the neural transmitters of the Gaia mind. The language of plants is chemistry. 
and they use chemistry in these complex conversations with everything in the biosphere. And in this way, they regulate interactions with every organism and every ecosystem of every size from local ecosystems, the size of a backyard garden, which is shown here, to the enormous planet-sized neural network that we call the biosphere. So planetary scientists recognize that the earth is structured in layers. Most of them come out of geology and, and planetary science. So they talk about the lithosphere, the geosphere, the hydrosphere and the atmosphere, but they've forgotten about some of the most important of the most, they've left out four of the most important spheres. The phytosphere is the layer of plants that enshrouds and protects the planet and keeps everything running. The mycosphere, in partnership actually, symbiosis, if you will, with the biosphere, are the mycelial networks that permeate the soil everywhere. The mycologist Merlin Sheldrake has coined the term the wood wide web for the mycosphere. The ethnosphere a complex, a concept that should be credited to Wade Davis is the layer of human cultures and culture diversity that enshrouds the planet. And finally, the neural sphere, the biocybernetic nervous system that we are extruding in as another partly artificial, partly biological layer across the entire planet. And this is what we call the World Wide Web. And so uh, that is a very quick snapshot of the idea of the Gaian mind and its evolution and the importance of these uh, signal transduction uh, processes and maintaining the viability and equilibrium of life on earth. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much. That's my talk. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, what a pleasant surprise. You didn't talk about what I thought you were going to talk about. <laughs> Instead, you, uh, you added a beautiful capstone to this uh, workshop and uh, tied a lot of uh, what the other speakers uh, were addressing together neatly into a beautiful picture. Well, thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Well, it was good, good to have you. Now we're going to open up the uh, panel to questions and, uh, and discussions. Uh, we'd appreciate it if you would come up to the microphone so that um, the remote uh, viewers can can hear your questions and uh, feel free to come up and I'll if you want to sit in this first row um, I can point to you easily that way mm. Rajneesh came up with a brilliant idea. We should probably take a 10 minute break and then reconvene. So uh, why don't we uh, come back in 10 minutes and we'll uh, launch into- well, That is a good idea. So- uh, Question and answer period. Testing. Well, uh, why don't we get uh, started with questions and answers? Um, show of hands for uh, questioners. Oh, uh, oh. So, hi. First of all, uh, thank you very much for these uh, interesting presentations. Um, very fascinating. And my question is towards you, Rajneesh. As you said, um, there is a fourth dimension, which is time. So we move forward. My question is now that we're coming into a time uh, of technology and science that we are reverse engineering um, aging. Um, 
how that ties into that. If we only can move in one direction, if we are far enough with technology to actually reverse uh, our aging, if you have an idea. Well, uh, you're not reversing time. You just come up with a way to alter the uh, course of development into a different direction. So uh, we, when we come up with uh, solutions to reverse, not to reverse aging, but to slow down aging. Uh, I don't think we, we will ever have a technology that will reverse, not what was that movie uh, or uh, there was, yeah. Uh, you can maybe, you know, you can reverse some aspects of aging or by reversal mean, means that some damage that, that may have occurred, you can correct that. But time is always moving in the forward direction. So you're using a different path or developmentally. But I think uh, Dr. Chopra has something to say. Um, I'm not the expert, but um, my conversations with quantum physicists, including Jack Tuzinski, who's here, um, the arrow of time should be reversible. Um, that just the movement forward may be an artifact of not understanding the deeper reality where time, the nature of time subjectively influences your biology too. So, you know, if you're, if you're running out of time, you actually speed up everything. Heart rate goes up, blood pressure goes up, platelets get jittery. And then if you drop dead of a premature heart attack, you run out of time. So time is a metaphorical expression of our experience of change and our experience seems to move in the direction of entropy always but then you have life which is the reversal of entropy every time a baby is born that's reversal of entropy life is the opposite of entropy or you might say creativity so the mathematics of quantum mechanics is is bidirectional, can be bidirectional. Never mind that. If you quieten the activity of the mind, you also quieten the movement of time. And if you have samadhi, which is you go beyond subject object split, which means there's no thought, you transcend thought, time disappears. In sleep states, deep sleep, there's no time. Okay? In dream states, there's fuzzy time. So from the Eastern consciousness wisdom traditions, time is the continuity of memory that uses your self-image, your ego identity as an internal reference point and also your biology as an internal reference point. To the extent you can go beyond all human constructs, um, you go beyond time, you go beyond the ego identity, you go beyond time. That's why psychedelics also that cause decrease in the activity of the medial, what is it called, the default mode network, which supposedly is the neural correlate of our ego identity. Time starts to disappear. Or people when they have uh, what you call uh, peak experiences, flow experiences, time is in slow motion. Uh, when you, uh, your breath stops as a result of pranayama yoga, again, time stops. So that's one way of approaching it. But secondly, I mean, you know, sometimes it's difficult to take one whole philosophical system and translate it into a whole different scientific. Because science is also based on assumptions, right? You always assume something to begin your argument. So science says, Human observation gives access to what we call empirical facts. But empirical facts is a species-specific mode of knowing and experience. Before I can call something a Higgs boson, I have to observe something. And what I observe is an event in awareness, not something out there. You know? And yet we say it's out there. But given that map, 
Now, there is a lot of very interesting research on what are called signal molecules. You probably know about these signal molecules that actually bring information of the reverse of entropy. They fix DNA self-regulation or bring homeostasis in body-mind simultaneously. Emotional homeostasis and biological homeostasis is connected. So we did a retreat in the year 2012 where we had um, Elizabeth Blackburn, Nobel laureate, measure telomerase, the enzyme that controls the length of telomeres before and after the retreat. And so tel telomerase level went up by 40%. Now other people were able to replicate that, which means we actually reversed biological age uh, for that one week. How long you can do it, don't know. But others have, in Elizabeth published this research. She had no idea what she was studying. She just, we just asked her to measure telomerase because she's the Nobel laureate. So, you know, current theories in science, even evolutionary theories, um, are based on uh, things that were not known even a few decades ago epigenetic modulation of gene expression, or how consciousness in its still states regulates and brings back self-repair mechanisms and homeostasis, uh, teleology. I mean, all this is emerging as part of the conversation. Bottom line is, I wouldn't rule out reversal of aging. So in Ayurveda, there's something called Kaya Kalpa, where you go into total stillness, silence, dark, and eat minimal. It's more than a 16 hour fast. You don't speak. And by the end of six months of this practice, your biological markers should be totally different than what they were. So we are doing right now something called the longevity experiment. And uh, you can check on its progress. Longevity, um, at chopraFoundation.org, where we are asking scientists to give their in their area of expertise, whether it's sleep or breathing patterns or signal molecules uh, or the uh, the understanding of the microbiome, because ninety nine percent of the genetic information in your body is not even human; it's microbial as as Rajneesh will tell you. So it's very complex when you put these things together. Right now, our longevity experiment is just getting, recruiting people who are experts in this area, whether they're scientists or neuroscientists or brain scientists or philosophers or uh, people who are engaged in the traditional uh, meditation traditions, bring everybody's expertise together. Sleep seems to be a very um, wonderful way of slowing entropy in the body. So that's why when you wake up in the morning, you know, you're refreshed. You've, you've gone non-local for the time being. Uh, first also, if uh, uh, Dennis would like to participate, is there a way where that he can? Um, Oh, okay. So, okay, perfect. So Dennis, if you would like to answer anything, just I think you'll just have to speak up. <laughs> uh, but I was going to add to, to that, um, the concept of time is like, like you said, is how we experience it. It's, it's really, and it, right. Uh, who we think our identity is. So uh, if you think of time in those terms, a photon, for example, that doesn't have any mass is not going to experience any time. It doesn't know uh, when it leaves uh, a, a galaxy billions of years ago and gets here, it, it's, there's, it has not experienced any time. And the, uh, so time is really related to mass and frequency of the mass. So I, I will also go back to, you know, uh, um, Vedas and uh, uh, 
when I think when we say a realization, so connecting it back to the spot on and what I was talking about as information, that information, of course, then does not experience any time. It's like a photon. So if, if we start to connect more and more with that information, we are becoming more and more realized, becoming more and more aware of losing more of your mass and more of your, and I think when you start to reach at those stages, uh, I will be actually surprised that, that those stages don't have benefits like increasing the telomeres and because uh, as you start to uh, come more, uh, become more uh, aware of how the existence is in your, in a way in your under, under your own control. And as time moves forward, I think that is, only, that is only going to increase betterment and may have direct physiological effects that may actually heal and help be someone become a, you know, better physically and mentally. I wanted to add, I think I heard a, a Buddhist, one of our Buddhist teachers say that time is, um, is causes and effects. And so when we look at a cause that then becomes manifest in a, a way that we can understand it, then that becomes time. And in, in a native way, we'd say that too. And um, there are ways to send prayers back into the past for someone when we're he trying to heal them. And there may be ceremonies where people will look at, a, I was showing you those ceremonial calendars where they will offer a prayer based on the ceremonial guardians of that time that presided and influenced a particular moment of time. And they may be called as part of the healing. And um, I think with this idea of slowing time or longevity, uh, many of our elders, and of course all over the world, there are people who live into their hundreds. Many of our elders lived into their hundreds. And um, it was a sign that we were in balance that we could live into our hundreds. My, grand, my great grandmother lived, to, she was 112, and one of our, an elder that passed away several years ago, she lived to be 118. And she was dancing almost to the end. So the question is then, if there is longevity, and I think where native thought would stress, and I think a lot of uh, ancient traditions, and where is the wisdom? What allows someone to accumulate wisdom along with the longevity? It's not just about self-care and, you know, but what are your relations and how are you living and how do we leave that? How does that become accumulated and compounded knowledge uh, experience so that human beings can advance? Otherwise, it's just an, it's an, an important individual journey. But as indigenous peoples or communal peoples, because there are many peoples that are part of communities, they may not be native, but the, the point is then that more that kind of that social network is to strengthen those relations that we have with other, not only people, but with our grandmother earth or with that we have water, we continue to have clean water. So there has to be connected to wisdom, to a deeper, a deeper kind of um, ability to understand a way that we're going to interact. Who'd like to uh, ask the next question? First of all, thank you for all of your wisdom. Uh, this is a question for Dr. McKenna. Dr. McKenna, um, I believe that the orchid family has the largest number of species of any flowering plant um, on, on earth. And they've done studies that have demonstrated pretty uh, unequivocally that orchids flowers often mimic insects uh, that they depend on for their pollination. And I'm wondering if you could comment on that in the context of whether plants are intelligent. Uh, well, yes, yes. Thank you for the question. Can uh, people hear me? Yes. Maybe not see me, but hear me. Uh, 
I, I'm not sure if the orchids have the largest number of species in the plant kingdom. I can't speak to that, but uh, it wouldn't surprise me, you know. So, so that's, uh, you know, uh, no, that's about all I can say about that. As far as the uh, orchids mimicking the appearance of insects, it's, it's definitely true. This is this is actually found throughout the plant kingdom, but the orchids are particularly good at this, you know. And and so that's a that's a perfect example of coevolution. You know, why should why should the orchids come to resemble the insects that pollinate them? Well, because I mean, you can invoke you can invoke lots of things, natural selection over time. You know, the orchids that had that appearance got pollinated more often. That would be the sort of natural selection model. Uh, but then maybe there's more going on than that. I mean, uh, maybe it's more of a symbiosis model. This biomimicry that that we're that we're talking about this biomimetic polymorphism that I gave an example of, which unfortunately I don't think you could see the slide. That was before we discovered that you couldn't see half my slides, but, but plants are able to sense in the environment. And there is actually some aspect of their physiology that we don't completely understand something like vision. You know, they, they, I mean, they don't have nervous systems, but there's evidence that the plant, like this bokila, that's able to change its morphology to resemble any plant that it's climbing on, how does it do that? And how it does it apparently is there's some kind of a visual cue, you know, because it's not, it's not biochemical, right? In the fact that demonstrated by the fact that it'll it'll do it with a plastic plant. I doubt it picks up on signal transduction molecules from the plastic plant, and yet it will change its morphology. So the answer is, the answer, there is no definitive answer. I think it's just one of those marvelous things about nature. This, this is about co-evolution. And what we said before, what I said in the, in the talk is plants uh, respond to their environment. The evidence that they're intelligent, not necessarily conscious, although maybe those things are equivalent, but plants respond to their environment to optimize their relationship with every other organism that happens to be in their environment. So this is just another example of that. But it's a pretty amazing example. It's one of those, you know, gee whiz things about plants that they can do. Nobody, there, there needs to be a lot more work about this. So that's my incomplete answer. Yeah, that's a good, as good an answer as we're going to get, I think. Exactly. <laughs> At least here. Um, do you have a question? Yeah. Um, so yeah, first I want to um, share about, you know, um, Dr. Deepak Chopra, uh, yeah, your deep insight about the reality. And um, um, yeah, so I want to just share some of our research. I'm a quantum physicist and string theorist. And recently, actually, I published a paper about there are two kinds of space and time. So one space time is what we measure. And another kind of space time is our consciousness are conscious of, you know, something's moving, something's still. And so I show that the consciousness space and time is related to uh, actually, you know, we used um, um, find they are actually forms this um, um, hologram and they actually, um, so I can derive the mathematics formula for this hologram and show that all the string theory, quantum physics, general relativity, all particles, elementary, Forces uh, all can be emerge from this from from this hologram of um, consciousness, space, and time. So it's really just like what you are sharing with us, and then 
um, yeah, so I just want to share you with that. And also about um, uh, talking about uh, Radish, your, um, your research. And so, um, so our research, we have, um, I did some research about, you talk about entropy. So in our research, we find that um, there are two kinds of information. One is uh, negative information, one is positive information. So negative information is uh, entropy, is a disconnection, disorder, which is entropy. But then there's positive information, which is a connection or order. And so um, in quantum physics, you can actually calculate. If I know your vibrational field, I can calculate how much positive information you have. And the positive information um, determines how much good health, longevity, wisdom, um, and also a spiritual power you have because you are connected, right? You just give the information, you can make things happen. So literally, like, if you have more positive information, you, then you have more power, you have more happiness, uh, you have um, more um, longevity. And um, so, so, you know, we find that um, we can give life a mathematic um, definition. Basically, life is a system that it can maintain, enhance, and develop more positive information. And uh, so that's a part of our, some of our research I want to share. First of all, I'd love to have access to your paper. Yeah, uh, yeah. It yeah, would be I'd wonderful love to, to share that uh, with you. Yeah. Wonderful you. to uh, try to understand it. Uh, here's, here's the question that, you know, we need to ask. And that is, what is it that wants to know? What is about human beings that we need to have an explanation? You know, and whether it's scientific explanation or all attempts on understanding reality come from the human quest to know if there is an ex explanation for existence. And so we come up with, you know, God created the universe or it was the Big Bang or it's cyclical or information disappears and then some of it leaks back and it contains all this. But these are all human constructs for exactly. knowing the sim symbols of experience. Before you come up with a symbol or a model, you have to have an experience. And the experience is totally unreliable. You know, the, 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 what's his name? Um, uh, Alfred Korzybski, who coined the phrase, uh, the map is not the territory. Mm -hmm. uh, he also spoke of how information goes through levels of abstraction before it reaches the brain. So, you know, once it gets to your retina, some information is lost. Then the action potentials, more information is lost. Then the neurotransmitter, more information is lost. But then suddenly you see a world. <laughs> and, you know, you have no explanation how abstracted information of electrical signals is producing this world. That's the mystery. Or if I ask you to imagine a snow-clad mountain or a rainbow, suddenly you have the experience. There's no rainbow in the brain. There's no sound in the brain. There's no color in the brain as we know it. There's no experience in the brain. You can cut the brain with a knife and there's no pain. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's more mysterious than we think it is. You know, we are one little species in one little speck of dust in the junkyard of infinity. And we come up with these explanations, which are essentially magical lies. Exactly. Everything you perceive is, a, is, is the play of illusion exactly. and, uh, and modeling. And yet, what is it about mathematics? Where is mathematics? It's a language, but not only does it describe it constructs reality, you know, if you also Gödel's theorem, where you can't prove the theorem, but it's true. I mean, so there are so many conundrums, so many paradoxes, so, mean, so much ambiguity to try and figure out reality out of that is all a human quest. But what is it that, who has the quest? Does your brain have the quest? Is mathematics in the universe? Is it in consciousness? I don't know. Um, basically, um, my understanding is 
uh, our consciousness create all this illusion, including this whole universe. And since mathematics is our mind language, that is why mathematics can describe all what is in the universe. Human mind. Yeah, language. because because the universe is our own construction, our consciousness construction. I'd love to see your paper. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I think I, I completely agree. You know, we can come up with all these terms, and uh, uh, but they are all just constructs based on our own experience. So, how what really reality is, we may never really find out. Uh, but at the same time, our limitations are how we think. Uh, we we want to describe everything with measurements, and that's where mathematics is as well. So everything that we can measure. Uh, we can describe in those terms. But as a biologist, I, I became a biologist because I wasn't very good at math. And I started uh, learning about how to approach a problem that is difficult. And before we get to measurements, we need to think about functions. And functions, of course, you know, going back to what Dr. Chopra said, if we think of functions of a brain or a function of something, again, it's limited to experience. However, um, many of the things that can be described in functions may, may be never be able to describe in mathematics. For example, if I want to tell someone, uh, I'm seeing color blue, this is a very common way to describe, you know, uh, the difference between mathematics and consciousness. I will never be able to, I can give wavelengths and all that, but the experience of color blue is not is transferable that easily. If someone is blind, for example. So, there is a level of function that how the, the color blue made me feel. I can, I can describe the feelings that I get from the color blue. So I can transfer that feeling. So this is why when I, when I started to look at the question of consciousness, I wanted to go and uh, describe it in the functional form. So Planck's length uh, is, is a physical measurement, but spot on is a functional property of the smallest space. And if you think of that that way, we may not even never even know or understand what kind of information drives us, yeah. but at least we can start to relate with what function it may yeah. have. But what happens is the information determine what information you give to your consciousness determines what your experience are. So um, basically, we determine our life yes. by what information we give to ourselves. So uh, so that is uh, that's to waken people up, you know, you determine, you create your own life by what information your consciousness you give to yourself and give to others. Yes. And um, so the purpose of life is to, um, you know, we talk about sy symbionics, you know, is about the to enhance the positive information, which is basically enhance our connection with each other. And ultimately, with a source, which is the emptiness, which is uh, Deepak was talking about, is the emptiness um, that is, uh, you know, in quantum physics, which has unlimited potential and uh, potential energy, information, and matter. And that is our true self, which has uh, ultimate freedom. That is the purpose we all want to go there, actually go back to the emptiness, which is we are completely free and we're completely powerful and internal. Great. I'd like to get a copy of the paper too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, well. <laughs> you know, when you were talking about uh, information, yeah, I just, I'm a writer. And so I was playing with words and I've talked about information, but when you break it as in formation, in hyphen formation, it seems to me part of, part of what your uh, argument is. Yeah. Um. I just sort of wanted to uh, to uh, to make an observation about um, what uh, we've been talking about about the uh, inability to uh, ascertain and describe reality through the use of language. And what <clears throat> occurs to me is that a lot of the time the value of language is not necessarily that it enables us to know with certainty some precise defined answer to a precise defined question. 
but rather that allows us to collaborate as human beings to take a consensus about our perceptions, what we are seeing, get some reassurance. And I know we all derive a great deal of reassurance um, uh, um, from hearing you speak, um, all of you, um, because what we feel is a correspondence um, in our own areas of study and work. And so I, I kind of wanted to uh, basically just raise a, a positive um, feature there. That yes, we do um, always, you know, as human beings, I guess we will always be left in some uncertainty about what our words really mean or where they can end. But um, I also think that they do provide this, uh, you know, this, uh, it's our Tower of Babel, it's our connection, it's our tree of life, it's, it's, it connects us from below to above, it, it makes sense, and we Absolutely. find our little homes at different levels on this tree. Absolutely, I mean, you were saying you found the word Aleph that was not taken, okay, now it's a thing, right, uh, Higgs boson is the name of a guy, Hilbert space, or, you know, mathematical space, as soon as we express words that we agree on in our interbeingness and we create language, we create the human universe, we create Wall Street, we create money, we create nation states, we create empires, we create, but what we don't understand, we, we also create the Milky Way galaxy, we create our biology, everything that has a word is our creation as a model or a symbol of the formless. Without the formless, there's no form. And every form is a phenomenon in the formless, which is the appearance of the formless modifying itself into sensations, perceptions, images, feelings, thoughts that we then model or create models sim symbolically. And semiotics is the the science of symbols. So everything you experience is a symbol of the formless you, and for that language is necessary. Not only this language, which is, you know, making a noise, but you can use hands for language, you can use body language, there's musical language, there's emotional language, there's mathematical language, Language doesn't describe, it. it constructs. It actually conceives and constructs our experience of reality. And if I, I wanted to confirm something that, you know, I, I've received, you know, heard from, from your own work, which is about the power of what we call sacred sounds, mantra sounds, sounds that have been um, nurtured in this environment, I mean, I, uh, you mentioned that being a, a Dharma practitioner, Buddhist practitioner, and, you know, I, I think we've all done some work with sound and mantra, and it seems to me like that's, again, another completely non-relative, not meaning-oriented value of, of language that we have there, which is to reconnect us with sacred, the formless, et cetera. Uh, one thing Charles uh, mentioned was consensus. I think that's really uh, important to me as a scientist. You know, I can have all kinds of crazy ideas, but unless I can convince somebody else uh, to buy into them, or better yet, prove they're right, uh, it, they don't carry nearly the weight that reality requires. So uh, just throw that out. I think you really hit on a, a key point that we haven't really talked about. Any more questions? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, all right. Okay, so uh, on my four minute walk from the main lodge to here, uh, I had, um, you know, a temporal experience of expectation uh, and uh, some ineffable feeling of receptivity. But it was only after I'd been here for half an hour that um, 
that temporal experience felt like 20 years um, of uh, preparation, or if not preparation, uh, the experience of unreadiness, which I think has dissolved um, because of what I've learned here. Um, I, uh, what you've brought to me, and I've been thinking about consciousness for decades, and um, in the last few years have been asked to bring out my research from 20 years ago, which I'm now putting together in a book called The Mechanics of Bliss. Um, what you presented here has just pivoted my understanding in so many ways. Um, so uh, this preamble, I probably, um, you know, I think that it would probably be a miserable experience for people to listen to all the questions I have. Uh, so I won't ask all of them, but uh, I'll ask just a few. Um, uh, so Dr. Rana, uh, you mentioned um, the photon as a, a kind of a transitional, as a, as, as a kind of, um, as some sort of transitional agent to bring the being or the organism or even the cell into a new space. This completely coincides with the kind of work that I've been doing, uh, which is the physiological substrates, uh, but particularly in the peripheral nervous system. Um, so it just completely rings true to me. Um, but I wanted to um, also comment that when human beings, when people talk about their story of change, whether it's in mythology or in literature, uh, and this is looking at thousands of works of literature, um, the arc of change or the arc of openness to a new register of meaning usually is described in the last few pages or the last page or even the last paragraph or with a lot of Nobel Prize works, uh, works by Nobel Prize winners, there is the sense of light descending upon the person or light being opened and light is an extraordinary metaphor for that transition into a new space, which is a new space of meaning. So I just find that extraordinary. Um, but the, uh, so I, I just wanted to mention that and, and uh, I, I guess maybe there's a question you can find in that, and if not, I'll move on. I, 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 I can comment on that. Yes. Um, I think, um, uh, like you say, light has been associated with enlightenment and uh, changing into a you know, different space, or, and it's been used philosophically. It's been used in many different ways. In fact, um, the term that we use for light uh, regulated plant development. So when light activates uh, different type of development in plants, we call it photomorphogenesis. Right? So it's light induced morphogenesis, which does not happen in the absence of light. So it's, it's really an interaction like uh, that the information that light brings. And that information, like I was saying before, comes in many forms and color and um, for example, photosynthetically active radiation, at least in plants, is red and blue. But what we see, visible light, is much bigger for us. But the radiation that comes from the sun is even larger. There is a lot that we can't see. And plants are more sensitive to certain other areas of light. One of them is far red. Plants can sense far red. We cannot we will see very dim. So ultimately, it's the physical environment that is influencing and can change uh, the development patterns and whatever happens. And that goes with um, not just physical development, but also mental development. And so a light has been used uh, in that sense as well. So Dr. Gonzalez, could, should I ask if anybody else wants to ask a question? Because I have a couple of questions for you. Okay, thank you very much. So 
Yeah, I wanted to ask you whether or not um, susceptibility to cancer from the misuse of tobacco uh, is uh, connected to the misuse of the plant's power. I think that's a better question for Dr. McKenna. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, well, uh, I don't know. I think maybe it's a better question for Dr. Gonzalez, actually. <laughs> but I mean, so so here, here here's the thing: the plants have power, right? And uh, and in the context of traditional use, you know, uh, you can't really separate that from them. There are, for example, practitioners in the Amazon who will t drink liquid tobacco and completely saturate their system with it. I mean, it, it would be ordinarily, it would be a toxic dose of tobacco. And yet somehow they are able to direct that energy of the plant. And there's, there's far more than pharmacology going on. You know, so in such a way that it actually strengthens strengthens them, it increases their resistance. I don't know specifically of to cancer, but to disease in general. So the 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 uh, you know the energetic aspect of healing of using these plants is is definitely real and it's also very hard to study in a scientific way you know as we understand tobacco and cancer and, and all that the tobacco particularly smoked tobacco can in produce these aromatic hydrocarbons that are carcinogenic but then how do you explain for example, uh, indigenous people, practitioners, medicine men, and so on. In the Amazon, tobacco is not separable really from, from traditional medical practices. So many of these people, I mean, they smoke like chimneys, basically. They smoke all the time, and they smoke for many, many years and yet they live well into their 80s, 90s, and sometimes beyond. You would think that with that ingestion, much ingestion of tobacco, it would have killed them a long time ago, and yet it doesn't. So, you know, there's that, and it's very hard to study these things in a scientific way. You know, I mean, you know that this happens, but it's very hard to design an experiment about that because with an experiment, at least in the way it's currently approached, you have to have controls. You need to have a control group, you you know, an experimental group. You can't replicate this stuff, this kind of thing, you know, in a, in the context of traditional medical practices. So I think it's a combination of, you know, people have, everyone is a biochemical individual. You know, you can have a, a person who may smoke a pack of unfiltered camels every day for the rest of their life, and they're fine. You know, they're, they're not affected by it. Other people will get cancer from that. And how do you put your finger on the mechanisms that, determine this person will get cancer and that one will not, you know, I mean, it, it, it's not simple. None of this is simple when it comes out. I do think that consciousness and your spiritual state has a lot to do with that. You know, if you're, you know, I, I think, I mean, we know that there are, uh, you know, relationships between the immune system and your conscious state. You know, if, for example, you're very depressed, you're more prone, your immune system is suppressed. So, you know, you're more subject to infections and other types of things that might affect you. Other people, 
you know, who are not depressed, maybe they have stronger immune responses. The thing is, so again, it's a place where you can't, none of this is simple and it's very hard to dissect it. You know, science, one of its limitations is it tries to limit all the variables and look at just one or two variables and what's causing that, what's involved with that. That's not the way the real world works. You know, people are complex, multivariate systems. Plants are complex, multivariate systems. And when they interact, it gets really complex. And you can't really dissect that out scientifically. So that's the, again, you know, a very long way of dodging the question in a certain way. So you can't really answer that. You know, well, it can't approach this scientifically. Well, thank you I very much. I would like much. to. Because yeah. I think that it's not just a mechanistic answer. Exactly. disease is culturally codified too. Exactly. Diseases are created and, and uh, dissolved by cultural change, for example. So it seems like, you know, this is, this is something for you. Yeah, um, it's going to be varied by communities and their teachings. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we use tobacco and people understood the power of tobacco and that's why there were such strict protocols around how it was used. So over time, who knows how they developed over this relationship of understanding that tobacco was something that had so much power that you had to use it with care and caution and under certain kinds of uh, very specific conditions because of its power. Um, so rather than say that it brought cancer, I would say that, could it bring cancer? I would say that we understand that certain things can bring on cancer and they can include, or, or in disease. And the disease can include offenses to the land, offenses to a place, uh, not being in proper relationship with it, and not being in proper relationship when you come in for prayer uh, you could create sickness for your community uh, and a disturbance in the environment. And then that could lose to, lead to some kind of illness that often uh, that varying based on people's traditions could be with the person, people involved, or could be even involved the blessing of the entire environment or the blessing of the animals. Uh, there are stories about animals also getting sick from people being in misconduct and not proper conduct. And this shows that intricacy of the relationship with people and the natural world. So it, it can vary by community, but um, we do say that cancer can be caused um, from traumas that um, are disturbances to the spirit and the soul. And that over time, if we do not address that, that soul displacement or that soul disturbance, it then can lead to depression. It's a precondition to cancer and depression and anxiety, breast cancer. So there are traditional teachings based on a community and they can vary. This is kind of an overview that, say, that says, well, this was caused because of a, a trauma that was experienced or in years past that eventually led to, not unaddressed, it, it matured into diabetes. It matured into irregular cellular activity. And can I ask you one more question, please? Thank you very much. Um, and it regards uh, the idea of uh, fallow season or fallow land or um, fallow growth. Uh, in a lot of um, indigenous traditions, there is worked into a season or worked into uh, sequences of years, uh, leaving the land unplowed or leaving um, uh, uh, the trees, the, the woods untended. Uh, you let the you let the dead branches fall. You let the you let the uh, the pigs and the squirrels eat the acorns, etc. And I wondered if you could speak to the relationship between humans caring for or having an active relationship to the plant, the sacred plant the trees as opposed to having a passive relationship to it. Um, because I think that this idea of recognizing a fallow season or fallow year, um, a voluntary um, 
uh, relinquishing of responsibility or connection. Um, you know, it's interesting and it's different um, than uh, either the dynamic of never having any relationship to trees or plants or et cetera, or always controlling them. I would just wondered if you could speak to that. Again, it's going to vary, um, but <clears throat> the idea um, that we let the land rest, that we let things be, yes, um, that we let a certain place recover or reconstitute or regather power or potency, or that we really don't have a place there. It is to be left for the spirits of that place, for the powers and the this other dimensions of life. That um, do I need this on my own level? Okay, all right. Um, th there was there is that recognition that it's it's just another stage of life that's happening. So <clears throat> probably, I mean, I don't even know. If we'd have to go into native languages to look at that word fallow, right? But it's it's a, a, a cycles of, of rest and and cycles of origination. Cycles sometimes origination be, origination is happening through what might people might think is dormancy. So then how do we break the languages to understand what's actually happening in that process of life? It seems like it's in rest, but it's, it's actually in return. It's actually active, but it's not a, a maybe seeable by our eyes, or it might be seeable when the people, because they see that when that bird comes, they know there's a sign then that something's gonna happen within a particular period, and they know it's okay then to start certain kinds of activities. I don't know if that answered your question. Thank you. Yeah, so about the cancer, um, the things, you know, um, it, you, I really appreciate your wisdom of native uh, wisdom about the soul get sick and um, spirit get sick. And uh, yeah, so in, in our research, basically soul is basically the, uh, in the content of information in our field. And um, so, um, so, you know, if we have negative information in our soul, that can lead to sicknesses. And in fact, you know, actually all challenges, difficulties, and sicknesses are due to the negative information. And we literally actually um, have the technique, technology to heal people in the soul level and then uh, quickly, um, quickly heal people's cancer. I, you know, I had a consultation with one woman, she had um, breast cancer. Uh, with one hour healing, two days later, she get tested, uh, there's no cancer. But before that, doctor said you have to have operation. So yeah, so this kind of, you know, it's just, I know the natives, you, you do this kind of healing all the time, as well as through all kind of ways. So yeah, so this is, I, th I think it will be the next level of medicine, and really realize our consciousness, um, which is, um, can cause sicknesses. And uh, this is actually higher level of medicine because it heals at the root, root level, not just on the matter level, but on um, not the energetic level, but in a higher conscious and uh, soul level, spiritual level. Yeah. Yeah. I work with people with cancer and prayer, people and family members that were in fourth stage, they were in what, what was called fourth stage. Mm -hmm. And my uncle, we doctored him and he made peace and with his family and he was given four months and he's, he's here 15, 20 years later and he's probably gonna pass from Alzheimer's complications not, not from any cancer. So we've definitely seen cancer. It's such a spiritual connection component yeah. To, yeah. To, to that illness. Yeah. Um, and so um, there's incredible stories that are in the record about a ceremony helping a plant grow within sprout up within hours from ceremony. Wow. So we know that, that um, and we are, one of the things we recognize with plants is that we came from them because we have receptors. Right. Why does this medicine work? We've developed receptors as human beings so that we can um, experience these, these other dimensions of, of the medicine or, or heal our liver or help you know, cleanse the liver or allow the body to restore. So, so that's where native thought understands that we're not higher than plants, right. that we have 
everything in life we have had to depend on for us to evolve. And, and that plays then into ceremony and prayers when we can talk to the medicine and talk to the body and, and have a, and have in ceremony, you, that's what you're doing. You're, you're talking to these other dimensions that are not necessarily recognized, becoming, becoming more recognized, obviously with holistic and alternative medicine mm -hmm. that we can see at times very dramatic um, results for someone to restore them so that the cancer recedes. And this cancer has a spirit because it's alive. It has matter, COVID has a spirit, mm -hmm. it's alive. And so this is, you know, even though we are in this next level of understanding how to treat the body based on what COVID has brought into this environment, um, a lot of knowledge that we have about plant medicine and herbalism has been from the kind of the people's empirical medicine of knowing how the body responded from the blood or from the liver. But then there's that other spiritual component that a lot of ancient cultures still hold that, that we can bring forth something that's that potential, that's mm -hmm. that field of potential uh, that we're trying to articulate here somehow. And that's the potential of life. Yeah, at the, the Hawaiians, they actually think the plants and the humans are brother and sisters. You know, they're like, um, they're coming together, co-created, um, yeah. Well, we're, so. we're talking about sort of a metaphysical thing. And I think meta-human, uh, I'd like to uh, you know, extend your question to Dr. Chopra. And so the, the pro qualities of meta-human, what is the source? Where, where, where does that come from? That's that's the biggest question. Consciousness knows itself by splitting into subject and object experience. Otherwise, there's no way for consciousness to be conscious. So at every level, there is the experience of me and the other, the protein signal molecule and the receptor. But me and the other are sensations, I'll repeat that, the acronym, SIFT, S-I-F-T. Me and other are sensations, sense perceptions, images, feelings, thoughts, that are modulations of consciousness knowing itself as a certain mode of experience. What we are experiencing right now is through a species of consciousness that we call human beings, homo sapiens. And unlike other species, we have language, narrative, story. Science is a story. Use this methodology, this mode of observation, this protocol, you get this result, that's an empirical fact, but actually it's a species specific mode of knowing itself as the other. So everything that you see is itself as the other, itself as the I. So, you know, we use this word I all the time. Where is I? You know, if I ask you, where are you? You'll say, I'm here. Well, there's no one inside that body. Okay, then you say, I'm there, uh, where you are. Well, if, you're, if you are here, how do you seem to be there? You know, where is the eye of experience? There's no little Deepak sitting here looking at the world through, this, through these eyes. So who or what is looking is a non-conceptualizable, unimaginable, formless, field of infinite possibilities, knowing itself through species of consciousness. So what I experience as the human body, the human body is not me, it's my experience. You see, and they say, oh, you know, out of body experiences are difficult to explain. In body experience is equally difficult to explain because there's nobody inside the body. So where is the eye of experience is the biggest mystery. Okay, the eye experience is formless, it's dimensionless, 
It's irreducible, it's unimaginable, but without it, you can't create an image. I say, okay, imagine a rainbow, you convert formless consciousness into an experience. Okay, every time you observe something, you're a new observer and a new scenery. New observer, new observed, new seer, new scenery. So the question is identity. All our problems come from identity, which is ungraspable. Are you the changing body? Or are you the awareness in which the changing body is an experience? And if I recapitulate my life, who or what is recapitulating? What is the I? The I is not a person. The person itself is an experience in I. So this becomes very, no, no, we create models. Okay, here's the quantum vacuum, and here are virtual particles. They're appearing randomly as determined by the uncertainty principle, but somehow they create this universe. I mean, look at, look at our logic here. Now we create models, and the models work in creating maps, and maps are useful in navigating certain experiences, but, you know, you can't, you can't, as they say, eat a menu, you have to eat the meal, and the meal is experience, and the experience is symbolic of that which is incomprehensible. I have a follow-up question. I think this, this leads us to a sort of a paradox, because as you were saying earlier, uh, that humans want to describe and know and there's a uh, there's a some need for us to answer all the questions but then i also agree with you that who is i we don't know so then then that leads to a question why is that i wanting that experience through the species uh, consciousness and and if that i is all knowing or has uh, understanding of those experiences then why when it does experience in the species consciousness, there is this search again to find out what it already knows. So that, that leads to a paradox. So, so it, it almost seems like uh, th there is a manifestation of some information that takes a form. And then that form becomes limited and loses some something. So now it's trying to find itself again. Um, I think it's okay to say there's no explanation or you can make up one, you know, uh, uh, but there's no explanation for existence or awareness of existence. There's no existence if there's no awareness of existence. Non-existence is not an experience, okay? So can you experience yourself beyond subject-object split? That creates a lot of conundrums initially even what is in spiritual traditions called the dark night of the soul. Everything I thought I was, I am not. Okay. Which mind am I? The mind of a four-year-old, the mind of a teenager? Do I even remember what I was thinking two weeks ago at Monday morning at seven o'clock, and yet I thought what I was thinking was very important? In the end, there's a very thin line between what is called liberation from concepts this is the conceptual body. It's, it's a concept. Okay, so when you really look hard enough, who am I? You can't pin it down. You know, changing body, changing emotions, changing personality, or the awareness. And what is this awareness? Where is it? So, you know, this is in spiritual traditions called the thin line between nihilism an ultimate liberation to create. Because if you're free of all concepts, free of all constructs, you start all over again, you know, like a child, all over again. But then as soon as the child is given the name and events in consciousness are labeled as objects, we create the world through subject-object split. So, uh, what is the explanation? It's the play of consciousness. Why? Don't know. Maybe love. 
I just wanted to, say, well, I, you all just, I just want to say this. I was thinking, well, I mentioned that, uh, that one of the creation stories from the Maya people is that the, the, the creators, the life makers, the life formers create humans so that they can talk to them, so that we can talk to the creators. So maybe the question is, what is it, what is our role in, in, the, in pushing forth the potential of consciousness or the potential of creation? Yeah. <clears throat> this is such a uh, profound, fascinating, and uh, ultimately confusing conversation. I love this. Thank you. You, you know, it, um, it drives home for me. I'd like to keep it simple. And as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking, all right, so we exist at the crosshairs of perception and awareness. Uh, you can't perceive without being aware. And if you're going to be aware, aware of what? Even if you're sitting with your, your feet dangling over the edge of the void, aware of what? So I can keep it simple. I can be at the crosshairs of perception and awareness, and I'm never going to get lost even if I'm feeling a little confused or fuzzy, I can sit right at that crosshairs. That's, I find that sort of helpful just in terms of meditation. If I'm meditating, if I'm doing anything, I don't even have to be good at meditation. All I have to do is dust off my point of witness. So there I am, dusting off my point of witness forever and always, sitting at the crosshairs of perception and awareness. And then I'm going to add something right in the middle of it, the crosshairs intent because otherwise i can't navigate otherwise it's theoretical conceptual i can't move from place to place i need to be and clarify my intent and i might as well color it with something so why not love you could color it with anything i suppose and as you're talking i'm thinking about dreams i'm thinking about going down to peru i've had a chance to get down there from time to time and then sitting with these various plants with these funny names like boba and sauna rainbow cosby chu chaki cosby and each one of these plants induces states of dreaming and you're like regular consciousness you might be like what's this i can't even feel it, it doesn't even feel like a cup of coffee and yet you go to sleep and uh, you enter into these dream states at which you may transform change they're like extraordinary, you may be lucid, half lucid, you may be meeting spirits, etc. But you're always at the point of at the crosshairs of perception and awareness. You don't get lost. You can't get to like be like so like adrift that you lose um, your center. Right? And then you can come back, wake up within a state of awe or disbelief and then go to sleep again and enter into a dream, into the dream, wake up back and forth so often that you think you look around and you think, wow, look at the great architecture of the mind. This looks almost just like a lucid dream. Like it's, ex it's just extraordinary to hear the conversation as this is unfolding and how all of like all of your viewpoints knit together. Um, and for myself, I feel like eternally grateful just to have you, all four of you here on planet Earth, uh, including you, uh, Dennis, um, right here, virtually existing um, within this conversation that's taking place around the planet. And your work has unfolded, all of you, you know, particularly look what's happened in the last 30 years. It's absolutely extraordinary to the point that well, your research and your, your, your commentary and the discussion has interwoven around the planet. And the conversation that's happening today is very different than this global conversation of 30 years ago. So um, I'll just throw it out there for what's worth. Thank you. Thank you. One thing, the impulse that we call love the impulse that we call love is happening everywhere. And that is the impulse to go beyond subject-object split. The subject-object split is artificial. Nature is one unified activity. And so the subject-object split helps us do science, okay? But it's artificial. 
and it's naive realism it, that what you see is what you get. But actually, the unseen is the mystery without which there is no seeing. And love is the ultimate truth, not a, just an emotion. That the emotion is an impulse for seeking the truth. And when you're when you're arguing, you raise your voice. When you're having a normal conversation, the voice is this. Um, when you fall in love, you whisper. And when you become love, you're silent. Nothing to say. Yeah, I love what Deepak just said. I think, you know, you can think about, you know, the talking about God or the silence or the formless, the emptiness, the vacuum is where we all come from, the, uh, the creator. And it created each one of, we all come from that. And we all come, you know, the creator created us and all we come to existence to experience love. And every existence is love. And that is why we come to existence and to experience love in all different forms and then go back to the ultimate love, go back to the love and to realize the ultimate love of the source. So, yeah, so it's beautiful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, any more questions or comments? Good. Let's uh, <laughs> let's go get a drink. <laughs> Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you all. See you someplace. Well, there is no such thing as place or time. So, but uh, appreciate the chance to participate. So, enjoy your break, and I will do the same. Bye bye. <laughs>